All right, folks. Welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, also known as Wolf. And uh, welcome to the show. For those of you who've never been on my show, um, it's basically just... Uh, it's basically a show about the paranormal. And we talk about all kinds of stuff. Usually we do, you know, 30 minutes catching up on whatever we got to talk to. And usually the guest comes on. Um, maybe 30, 40 minutes, sometimes an hour into the show. Sometimes I tell stories to start off. Sometimes I just get right to it. I got a few things to talk about, and then we're going to get to it tonight. Because the guests I have on tonight is going to blow your mind. So you need to get everybody you can to get on this show. We're going to start. We got to get some people in the chat here. Ron Murphy just uh, announced he's working on two books right now. Kenny Irish's book is still going strong. Guys, uh, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. That's the email address, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. Um, I'm, I'm glad to say that I've actually lost some weight since the conference even. The people were like in the pictures and they were, you know, my haters were like, oh, look at you, you're fat, you know, whatever. Yeah, I had couldn't work out for five weeks. And then I went up to the conference looking like a manatee. Um, felt like it too. And then a couple days after I got back, I felt, you know, decompressed and everything. Felt a little better. But, uh, yeah. So the conference was great. Nick Redfern wrote an article for, I think, Mysterious Universe. Let me make sure I, I posted it earlier. If you go back and read the article, it's about the Dogman Conference. I posted it on my personal page and on Paranormal Roundtable Group and in several other groups. Um, yeah, Mysterious Universe. Nick Redfern wrote an article. The Dogman, uh, the Dogman Phenomena Conference Road Trip, New Revelations and Monsters. So, go check it out. It's a good read. Nick Redfern, freaking legend. Guy's a, guy's a legend. He's written more books than anybody in this field. Um, the people seem to, like in his new book about the pyramids, people thought it was cool to go on there and attack him. Bunch of people talking crap. So many geniuses know how the pyramids were built. I didn't realize that they all knew that. Apparently they did. People are haters. They're jealous. Folks, what I, we need to do, though, what we need to do is we're, we're, we're creating not just a family, not just a coalition, but a movement in this field. We need to get rid of the old guard. The old guard's got to go. If guys who are leaders in this field deviate from what these old guard um, want them to, to do, want them to say, they get attacked. I notice it on their Facebook pages and Instagram. It's like there's always somebody snarky, you know, oh, you're doing Dogman now, you know, especially the old Bigfoot guard. You know, they're so scared that their narrative might change. And the UFO people too, same thing with ghost people. It's all the same. They have this old, antiquated idea about what they think these things are, and none of it's connected. It's some compartmentalized bullcrap. When anybody brings up the idea that it could possibly be all connected, then, oh my gosh, well, you're an apostate. How could Dogman be connected to ghosts or UFOs or Bigfoot? I could parade witness after witness after witness, uh, you know, night after night after night, and these people would still be stubbornly stuck in their archaic views. So kick them to the curb. They don't want to, you know, in this in this business, is like in any other business. It's a field, it's a business, it's a community, whatever you want to call it. I guarantee these people, though, they look at it more of a business. But you're either leading, you're following, or you're getting out of the way. Nobody's going to follow those people anymore. So you're not leaders. So you either get in line and you follow us, or you get out of the way. Go on. Bye-bye. Run along. Take your archaic, silly views with you. Nobody wants to hear your dribble anymore. Stop critiquing people like my friends. Stop jumping on their posts and, and, and trying to keep them in line with what you want to believe. You want the world to be a certain way, and it's not. And you're scared. 
you're scared because the truth is the truth and you just you're not you're not you're not having it. I was on the phone with this guy the other day and he was trying to tell me how the world was. I agreed with that about 0.1% of what he was saying. What do you think of that? I said, wow, that's, that's far out. I was like, then let me tell you my views. I think his head exploded because he hung up. Maybe he, maybe he just like you know, he fell over and turned his phone off on the way down. Because I don't believe some of the bull crap. I don't believe that these things are your friends. I don't believe that they're happy tree friends and they're gonna we're all gonna get along. Well, happy tree friends are actually pretty roguish, but I don't believe that, that they're your buddies. You can't feed them apples and biscuits and hope for the best. So uh, thank you for that donation. Um, Anthony, if you're listening, I need my glasses. I don't want to get up and run in there and stop the show. Thank you, Jamie Roshan. Roshan. I appreciate that donation. Um, thank you to everybody that donates, because after the conference, we could sure use it. But donations are not expected, but they are definitely appreciated. The address is you can send things to. People are asking about that again. I had a couple people, Messenger, wanted to send me something. That's sweet. I appreciate that. 6001 West Palmer Lane, Suite 370, PMB 131, Austin, Texas, 78727. Once again, that's 6001 West Palmer Lane, Suite 370, PMB 131, Austin, Texas, 78727. That is the Postal Annex. And a shout out to them for the really cool posters they made. They did a really good job. Postal, Postal Annex, Kevin and Ashley did a great job. 6001 West Palmer Lane. Palmer is P-A-R-M-E-R. -E so in case, you know... You don't know how to spell it. That's how it's spelled. Um, I want to send a shout out to Anna and Jasmine, my friends at Juice Land. Um, I actually, them, them two, and I didn't get the other girl's name. She's working in the back, but they're all three from Austin. Now, folks, I don't know. That's almost a paranormal event in and of itself. Literally 10% of the people living in Austin right now are from here. They were born and raised here. And all three of those uh, girls were from here. That was amazing. I was like, what? 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 It was crazy. Uh, thank you. The other thing I want to say is I want to send a shout out to my friend Ed Brown, who... Uh, is going to be training Anthony. He's a former Mr. Universe, a great guy. I ran into him at the gym. I've known him for a while. And we know some of the same people. We've run in the same circles. I never competed for Mr. Universe, but I used to, to lift pretty heavy with a lot of big guys. And Ed is a great guy. Wanted to give him a shout out on the show. Um, funny guy. Funny, fun to talk to, you know. Uh, and also, don't forget, next week we have David Spinks, who's written a book about dogmen in, I think, Virginia or West Virginia. Don't quote me on that. But David Spinks, uh, Ken Gerhard recommended him. And then I got Carter Bouchard, who's got a ton of, of stories about dogmen and Bigfoot. And he's got a couple crazy Bigfoot uh, dogman stories. And we're going to talk dogman and Bigfoot. That's on September 6th. And then we got Shoddy Boy, uh, Mark Hindu, who's going to be on September 13th. That is Bettina's friend, um, and he's going to come on the show, and we're going to talk. I met him at the conference. He's a great guy. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the article by Redfern was pretty interesting. Check that out. Um, also, I want to send a shout-out to my friends over at, at uh, Black Sheep Boxing. They went to Wichita Falls, and they went 8-0. The fight was called Dominion, and um, the owner is Jeff Meadows and Allison Wood. They're, they're partners, uh, and they are really great people. Um, I can tell you right now. So, uh, I want to say a uh, shout out to Josh Scales. He's one of the uh, the coaches there, Muay Thai coach. Max uh, Williams, who's, who's a boxing coach. 
Um, and of course, Jeff Meadows and Allison Wood, they're all great people. And um, I wanted to, to promote them. You know, they are really cool. They, they let us train there and they're just, they're just really nice people. And um, so, yeah, they went up there and they kicked butt. Black Sheep is just, it's tearing, they're tearing it up. In Texas here, they are, they're producing fighters, champions. MMA, Muay Thai, uh, boxing, they have great coaches, a great system there. And Jeff, I want to say something, he, he uh, had a lot of problems at one time. Um, he it makes no bones about it. Um, he made a, a place for recovering addicts and former alcoholics. And he takes them in and he turns them into fighters, champions. It's really cool. He gives them a second chance at life. So that's commendable. And Allison's going to come on the show one, at one point because she's she's going to be at some point because she's had a, an encounter uh, during sleep paralysis with some sort of creature. So I'm going to have her on the show. So yeah, that's the next, next three weeks, the, li the live streams. Me and Barton are going to begin recording this week with Josh Dinocchio. If you haven't checked out Josh Dinocchio on, uh, on his um, channel, What Lurks Beneath, go check it out. Uh, he dropped the Mysterious Kentucky episode last week with Barton, where he reads uh, Barton's book. And within, I don't know how many views it's got now, but within two hours, it had 25,000 views. And so I was up late last night on the phone with, with Barton, uh, me and Nelly and Barton and uh, Josh Dinocchio. Shout out to him. Um, he does amazing work. Great kid. Good guy. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to say something. Real quick, before we call Martin on, we're going to call him in a few minutes here. I was talking religion with, with, with somebody the other day. We were talking about Bible theology, and it was Jessica Jones. She was on the show, and she has a great show. And she works for Space Out Radio, too. Also, Michigan Rob, that's one of the people in, in t Big Tex, and Jason. She, so she's friends with all of them. They have, like, a little coalition. Um, but... Uh, you know, we were talking, uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before, we were talking, or yesterday, I guess, early, and we were talking about Bible theology. And she's a remote viewer, but she's also a Christian. And we got into some pretty deep stuff. And, you know, I, I wanted to say something on the show to everybody who, to understand, like, because we were talking about the nature of the universe and, and the nature of, of reality and what it is. And people really don't understand it and if you you had a greater understanding of it you could you could probably navigate the waters of life a little better it's perception but make no bones about it dude satan the devil whatever you want to call him he is the god of this world and it's a very uncomfortable thing people don't want to hear that they don't want to hear that 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 that, that is who their god is because if you don't have christ if you don't have god that's who your god is there's no gray area there. You're, you're either with the Lord or you're not. Now, you may be a good person, and you may not go to hell. You may, I mean, you know, in my opinion, I think my belief is a little different. But you're not going to go to where, you, you know, to your final destination until you get yourself right. And in the Bible, Jesus is taken up to the mountain by Satan. And he says, behold, all the kingdoms of the world. He says, this can all be yours if you would just forget all this salvation stuff, forget the one most high, you know, and just worship me. He says to follow him and worship him. And, you know, Jesus, he just says, okay, that's cute. Get thee behind me, Satan. But let me say something to you. How can the devil offer those things if it didn't belong to him? Because it did, and it does. And I was watching some awards, some Emmys or Grammy, I don't know what they're called, the Oscar, Grammy, I don't know, some crap years ago with an ex who, who just, and she was just like, isn't that nice? She's thanking God. I said, yeah, she's thanking a God. Oh, you got to be so negative. I'm like, really? Because I didn't hear her mention Christ or even Allah. She didn't mention any God specifically. She just says, I want to thank God. Ron Yelton, yeah, actually, Satan, Satan is is just a catch-all for these the evil the beings, yeah. Um, 
you know, it, when, and when when these people, the elites, think God, do you know who they're thinking? They're thinking Satan. Because they know that he's the God of this world. He's the Lord of illusions. He's the master of this matrix, of this counterfeit. The reason that God sent his son Christ to pull us out. I want to get all preachy here, but that's the truth. Just, just being honest. And, uh, it, and it must have been funny when Jesus was up there. Because like, if you're up there and you're Jesus, and, and the devil comes and says, Hey, you can have all of this. And Jesus is like, dude, you know... I'm from the one most high. I'm from heaven. Like, what? <laughs> It'd be like if tantamount to you walking on the street and some bum comes up with his, you know, his little shopping cart. He says, hey, buddy, all this stuff in this shopping cart could be yours. You just worship me. You know, just forget about all that stuff. You're a nice house and your warm bed. Just... Hang out in the street and worship me, and y'all, you look, let's see what we got, you know, I'll take some inventory here, what I could have to offer you. You're looking in there, and you're like, oh, you got an old boot? Hmm, an empty bottle of Tide? That's, I mean, that's nice. Oh, a street sign. Yeah. Pulls it away from you. Ah, you haven't worshipped me yet. You're not getting that yet. Oh, oh, sorry. Change cup. And a dirty overcoat. And a broken clothes hanger. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, you know what? I, this sounds great. I think I'm just going to give up on everything because I have to face a few hardships, you know? Um, and I think that I'm just going to, yeah, I'm just going to hang out with you. I'm going to live under a bridge like a troll with you and worship you. And we can shake our, our, ch our change cups and maybe make some money every day and... Oh, sounds like a great deal. I'll give up my warm, comfy bed and my nice house to, to go and follow you. Why not? <laughs> what do I have to lose? <laughs> my soul. But that's exactly what some of these people do. They follow the shoddy, counterfeit bum known as the devil, and they forsake God and Christ, and they, they think that they know it all, and they have all the answers. So go ahead, keep doing that. Right now, folks, I want to ask for prayers from for Linda Godfrey. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to say a prayer right here because Barton only asked me to do this, and, and my wife did too, and this is what's right. So if you're offended by Jesus and prayer and all that, and you want to jump off here because you don't like me saying all that, and you're not willing to, to deal with this, to get to the, what, the show, whatever, well, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sorry. Lord God, I pray unto you in the name of Christ, I ask you for healing of Linda, but only if it is your will. Please heal her. Please heal her body, and we lift her up in prayer to you, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that you do what I know you can do and perform a miracle for her. But if it is not your will, and it is your will for her to continue on this path, then it is what it is. We pray this and we ask in the name of Christ, things are for it is your will. Amen. People are like, well, if you start praying on your show or whatever, you know, my blah, 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 blah. Then you just separate the wheat from the chaff, right? I don't come on here and pray all the time. All I do is I just want to help send positive vibes and prayers for my friend Linda if it, if it is God's will. Then it is God's will. If God, if God decides it's time, then it is time for whoever. It doesn't matter. But I have to do my part. And I can't be up here and be ashamed. They say in the end, we're all going to get our heads cut off. Well, it is what it is. I enjoyed having my head for as long as I'm going to have it. <laughs> They're going to have their victories, dude. Evil always does. We keep losing, too. People think the good guys win, and then they, and it starts. It doesn't. That's not what the, the, the bad guys have won over and over again. And they're going to keep winning until the end. And when it comes time and they ask you whose side you're on, I hope you make the right choice. Because that's where it's at. I don't care. People would say, you know, whatever, we're going to kill you, we're going to, you know, whatever, dude. It's been, it's been nice being here. But, you know, I had a good run. 
When it's time to go, it's time to go. So here's what we got going on. I got a bunch of people who want merchandise, who want me to send it to them. Um, going forward, I offered a bunch of shirts, whatever. We're trying to get, we're trying to allow as many people as possible to get a conference T-shirt. Now those are limited print, so we're going. We're asking for 25 on those. So if you want one, um, it may take a little while. But if you if you buy the shirt, I'll throw something else in there for free. Um, most of the stuff I'm willing to give away, but the conference shirts, they were limited print. And it was partly because Barton Nunley, he had his, lo his he drew the, the logo on there. So, you know, most of the stuff I'm not even asking for, but just those shirts in particular, they were limited print and, you know, and I, they're going to, we're not going to make a bunch more because then this the, the means nothing. If everyone had one and you didn't go to the conference, um, but the, the regular stuff, I don't care about. I mean, it's just whatever. If you want something, hit me up. If I can, if I got it and I can spare it. Typically, we choose people uh, as to, to be winners, you know, on for the merchandise giveaways in the books. The man that I'm bringing on in just just a minute here, he actually has written a book about his experience, and he gave it away at the conference, and he talked, and he stole the show. Nobody spoke when he was up there. Everybody was quiet. So we got to set this up. Can you get this number typed in? Phones here. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hey, Martin. Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Can you got me too? Yeah, I got you right yeah. now. I'm gonna have to try to get this other call uh, made. Okie dokie. Okay. Let me see. Get <laughs> ahead. Yeah, because we don't have them on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we'll get we'll get our buddy on here and then we'll get started. Are you there, Barton? Yeah, I'm here, Wolf. How's it going? How's it going, buddy? Okay, so I got you and I got Martin Groves on the line. Um, now, if anybody hasn't heard, me and Barton are teaming up to uh, do the show. Uh, we're going to be releasing a bunch of episodes in about a month, uh, maybe sooner. depends on how long it takes us to get them all recorded. So, everybody, Barton Nunley, the author. Um, so... Martin, you have an incredible story to tell, and you told it at the conference, and I wanted everybody that, that couldn't make the conference to be able to hear your story. Are you there, Martin? Yes, sir. Yes, okay. sir. Can y'all hear Martin? Can yep. everybody hear him? Yeah, see what the response is here. Thank you for the donation, Holly, Ryan, uh, Elafferty, Holly M, Titan, Ethan Seal. Thank you, everybody, North Carolina Cryptid and Paranormal Project. Thank you for the donations. We appreciate it. It's greatly appreciated. Hello, paratroopers. Hello, Martin. Hello, Barton Nunley. It is very good to hear your voice tonight, sir. Good to hear yours, too. Sure is. I'm sure you're going to excite all these wonderful viewers with your story. Yeah, Thank when, you, when you, I want to I want to say something. When when you came on the stage after Barton told his story, which was everybody was just listening to Barton intently, because um, Barton, your story, which is going to be in your book, the Spotsville Monster that you're writing, right? That's correct. Yeah. 
and then Martin came on on stage afterwards, and I, you know, he just absolutely just riveted the crowd, me myself included. Yeah, yeah. He so, absolutely did. Absolutely. So we got Martin to come on the show and talk. Martin, have you ever talked about this uh, publicly, uh, uh, except for the conference? Had you ever talked about it publicly? No, and and that uh, that was one of the most uh, fascinating things for me personally is that um, besides the actual movie documentary by Seth Breedlove, American Werewolves, I had never shared my story publicly whatsoever. And tonight actually will be, if you counted the movie and you counted talking in Par- at Paris in, in front of uh, those wonderful folks there that attended the conference, this would be my really my third time, but my second time only publicly speaking about it. Yeah. So and that's crazy, a- a- Amy. Thank you for that donation. So, what? What? It, 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 okay, where do we begin? You were in law enforcement, right? Yes, sir. Um, I recently had retired uh, in 2013, and I had been with the same department in Tennessee for 26 and a half years. And I don't mind telling folks where I worked. Uh, it's public records, and it's nothing for me to uh, to worry about or anything through the department. I, most of the officers and the sheriff knows that what I have done with my book and the movie. But I work for the Robertson County Sheriff's Office located at 507 South Brown Street in Springfield, Tennessee, for 26 and a half years. And when I had retired, I had retired with a total amount of service uh, with another department, and the combined service at the sheriff's office would have been 32 years as a total uh, for career in law enforcement. And my career spanned, I was a uniformed patrol officer in a uniform my entire 32 years. 32 years? Total of 32 years. Jeez, so that's a long time to be in law enforcement. Um, my next question: As all the years you were in law enforcement, you were working in the LBL. I worked uh, at a local sheriff's department. We were approximately uh, about 90 miles from the down downtown, what I would call downtown land between the lakes, at a uh, town of Springfield, Tennessee, which is located approximately 20 miles uh, north of Nashville, Tennessee. Okay. And... In all those years that you worked law enforcement, I mean, did you, like, I guess let's go back to when you were young. You you grew up in the area, Tennessee? I grew up in the area of Kentucky and Tennessee. I was very blessed, like Barton, to have been born in one of the greatest states of of here in America, which is Texas? the bluegrass state of Kentucky. Oh, okay. Kentucky, sorry. I thought you were talking about my I country. I moved to Tennessee at an adult age, and uh, I had spent my entire adult life uh, here in in this area. And I've been with the department since I was basically a kid. And uh, so I grew up. I grew up as a policeman. Really, I mean, I I felt like I was a mature individual. But man, I I sure did grow up as a police officer, as deputy sheriff. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and so what we're about to talk about here is something you kind of had to wait until you were out of the law enforcement to talk about. I, you know, it's it, it's a very strange thing. Um, I knew the ridicule that I would face, that we had had an encounter of something that could not be explained, where most most folks or most people would not understand. And in my professional career, this was just something, there's two things that held me back. One was the public ridicule, and two, uh, I had been told to remain silent. Uh, and not speak of this incident. And so 
we decided to remain quiet, and uh, I actually was never going to tell my story whatsoever. There's a twofold, uh, two twofold story that come out. One, I was never going to tell the story, but there's two things that prompted me. One was the what I will call the late great, very Christian man Johnny Henderson. Mm-hmm had seen that I was asking questions on, on a page one, one, one night. He and Elijah had picked up that I was asking some questions in a cryptid group, which prompted them to contact me. And uh, Mr. Johnny and Elijah both had promised me anonymity that I would remain totally, uh, my name would never be used, and they kept that promise. And uh, I was, I honestly was never going to tell my story. The second thing that occurred was about this time that all this was going on, and this was, this was before Mr. Johnny had become sick, and he, we'd lost Mr. Johnny and Miss April. Um, there was a case that came out in early 2020, I think it was, where I had read of another incident in Land Between the Lakes of which a man and woman had um, had parked their vehicle and went hiking, and they disappeared without any trace. And I had read about this, and then all of a sudden the story just was either dismissed or was taken off any news media channel. It was in the paper at one point, and it was on uh, social media, and I actually knew officers in the area that searched for this man and woman in land between the lakes, and um, nothing more was said. It went totally silent. So we'll flash forward a little bit, and uh, things occurred. We, we lost Johnny and April Henderson. Yeah. Time progressed. And all of a sudden, I receive a phone call from Elijah Henderson. He contacted me via public service and from uh, social media status, email, wanting to know if he could share my story and what I felt about coming out and talking with some individuals over at Land Between the Lakes. And that was, he put me in contact with Seth Breedlove and Heather Moser. And I felt like that it might be a good time to come out and to truly my my beliefs and my what I wanted to accomplish was I wanted the story to come out because to be quite honest, I wanted I don't want to see any families hurt. I don't I don't want to see another person come up missing in any of our national parks or land between the lakes and so thus this is how my story has come out. And so that, and okay. Do you want to get into the story, and then we can talk a little yeah, that, bit about that. Know. Would be fine. That would be that would be fine. And I'll and I'll just start from here then, and uh, mm-hmm. I'll uh, I'll tell my story like like it follows. And and please feel free, you or Barton, to to jump in in case I either ramble too much or I, I forget something and uh, help me out a little bit, coax me a little bit. Mm-hmm. That's not you a problem. It, not a problem. Go ahead, Martin. Just uh, tell, tell the audience what you told us when you were in Tennessee, when we were there with you in Paris. Okay. Thank you, Josh and Barton. Um Folks, uh, to get started with this, I'm going to have to take everybody back to 1993. And if most folks can go back to that and remember, this was a time where cell phones were not really readily, uh, not everybody had one, and I certainly did not have one. I had no camera. I had a uh, hunting partner that I worked with at the sheriff's office that he and I had been very close in the department for some time, and we had worked on so many cases and just so many calls, and we had become very close, just like brothers. 
And he and I hunted and fished together on our on our off days off, and we had made a decision we were going to go up into land between the lakes and kind of go primitive camping and just do some hunting. Uh, we had hunted deer and turkey together and fished, and we wanted to do a primitive hunting camp and go up into LBL. So be uh, in the very early spring of 1993, and Harry and I decided that we was going to go as deep as we possibly could. So I researched in the LBL and different locations, and I might add this to everyone so that that folks can understand that uh, I was raised in the woods. Uh, I had been hunting and fishing and trapping at land between the lakes since I was a kid. Um, years and years of just fishing and catching catching fish and, and taking uh, deer. So I was not a... Um, First time, uh, first time rodeo into LBL, and neither was Harry. We had both been into the, the park many times, and I must tell everyone at this point here before we start that we had never heard anything. We had no cause to have any fear. There was no reason for us to even have any caution about it. We were just laid back and, and go hunting. So, one Friday, we decided to head on up for a uh, three-day hunt in the LBL, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, for legal turkey hunting. And uh, we entered the park from the south side of the Trace, uh, Dover, Tennessee. And we had two or three different areas that we had decided that we would like to go in and, and do our hunt and find us a camp. It took us two or three hours to locate what we felt was a a nice, uh, just a, what I would call a perfect hunting area and great camp spot. We had, had a, found an area that had some old growth uh, trees and we found an area that the uh, park officials had left uh, cornfield standing for uh, um, uh, different types of wildlife for the deer and turkey. And so we chose this one spot, and we were somewhere in the area of uh, just off the Woodland Trace Road, um, pretty close to the old bison um, area for, for where the bison actually uh, have have what they have a small prairie. Now, this is not the same location at the, as the bison, the buffalo, are at today. So we set up our camp, and we decided to pitch our tent and to just kick back in on the first night. We set up a nice little campfire, and we had a very quiet evening our first night. First night. And... Uh, we had a, something to eat, and we didn't have any uh, issues. We had an old kerosene lamp. We decided to use kerosene rather than any modern type of lighting. The two of us only had a small mini mag light apiece. And uh, I think at the point I had an old headlamp, but didn't really intend to even use the headlamp. Our first night in was quite normal. We had a little raccoon that come in on us and kind of woke us up during the night, and I rolled over and seen that he was just, he had decided to visit us for a while and rolled back over and went back to sleep. The first night we had us a little rain come in, and that prevented us from the next morning from getting out and going early, and we knew that the birds, the turkeys, would not come off their roost, and uh, we kind of laid back at camp until the rain subsided and Harry and I talked and we decided to go our separate ways for the turkey hunt. He stayed closer to camp in a area of a corn patch that was actually adjacent to our camp, probably about a 40, 50 acre patch of corn. One side of us, we had a huge cane break where there was a lot of cane that was growing. I chose to be the more, I guess, the more adventurous one, and 
I chose to go and follow a trail that went above our camp. What I'd like to draw a picture for everyone is that our camp had a very large um, outcropping right behind our tent of a rock wall that was probably 50 to 70 foot in height. I had a good game that led me out of the camp and led me above that ridge and took me for quite a few miles and uh, I went walking that morning. Spent most of the morning actually looking for sign and trying to find some turkeys. I used a locator call and uh, did have some sign of some turkey, but as my day progressed in the woods, the one thing that kind of threw me off uh, about the woods is the further I got from camp, I wasn't finding any sign. Now, I'm a... I'm a pretty, I won't say a really good hunter because I'm very humble, but I'm I'm the type of hunter that I notice each and every sound and each and everything, and I'm not finding any, any type of wildlife, which is very odd for me. I'm, I'm usually, uh, it's very usual for me to find deer sign. It's very usual, usual for me to find turkey droppings. I tell the, even down to the droppings, I can tell if it's a male or a female. Uh, and I wasn't finding anything. It was so quiet in the woods. Now, these woods that are adjacent to the trace where I'm located is a very large area of nothing but woods. There's nothing in those woods. There is absolutely no buildings, no sign of anything but just trees upon trees, lots of chiggers, and lots of... Uh, just a lot of insects so as my day progresses i've decided that i'm not finding anything and i wanted to exit the woods to see what else i could find and as i'm walking through the woods i found me a small dirt road that was adjacent to all this and i came out onto the road and i took a break and i was maybe eating a little snack or two and all of a sudden I heard a vehicle coming up a uh, up this road and it was very odd that I would even hear or see a vehicle as far back into the woods and the area that I was located in but here come a little Toyota pickup truck and uh, the gentleman saw me and he stopped and he got out of his truck and we began to talk quite a bit and we kind of identified one another. He, he told me his story briefly. He was a firefighter, and he lived in the state of Kentucky. And uh, I told him my, my little story of being a deputy sheriff. And uh, we exchanged pleasantries, and we kind of made fun of each other's names because back home in his state, he was known as Bubba. And over on my side of the state, I was known as Bubba. And uh, we kind of verbally, you know, toyed with each other and kind of made fun that he's the Kentucky Bubba and I'm the Tennessee Bubba. And uh, the the young man, he, he he very much impressed me with his knowledge and his different uh, looks and views of life as a firefighter and mine as a deputy. And uh, he started making fun of me because I was carrying a gun and he was carrying a bow. And uh, he wanted to know how you know how it was, and I'm carrying a big old shotgun that it didn't seem to be too fair for the turkey when I needed to be carrying a bow and arrow and take it like our uh, ancestors did. And uh, so we just talked back and forth. And the reason and purpose of this is you will discover what happens in a few moments. But we said our pleasantries and shook our hands and. As he was leaving, there was one thing that I, I will recall that he said to me that he told me where his camp was, was was just a little over a mile away, further than that on the trace road, but through the woods and hollers that he was a little over a mile from where we were located. And so we said our goodbyes, and he drove off, and I remember thinking what a, what a kind, kind and nice young man that he was. And little did I know that I may actually have been the last 
person that spoke to him. Uh, may have been the last person to actually see him alive. So I packed up all my little belongings, got back on my hunting time, and decided to go back into the woods. And I realized at this point that it was starting to get late. Now we're we're talking about you know just a few hours before before darkness had come, and I knew it was time to head back. I probably had strayed a little bit too far from my camp, so I entered the woods. I got back into the woods and hadn't been in the woods very long and and just walking at my normal pace when I heard a very strange noise in the woods that I look back now, I, I wish I had been more conscientious and I had been more, I don't know, I guess, uh, the thought of safety but I was very comfortable in the woods I just never had anything to bother me in the woods in my life I heard a very strange sound that was like metal like a large opening or a what I would call an opening to a pole barn or maybe the latch on a, on a heavy ship or something that it just screeched and made this huge metallic noise and at that moment I thought to myself how funny that it, how odd that it was knowing that I was in an area and it didn't sound like a vehicle there was no vehicle that could have made that noise and uh, I just wrote it off be straight with you I just wrote it off and continued on about my way it was a short time later that as I began to walk and trek through these, this very tiny, small game trail heading back to my camp, that I, I caught some movement and heard some noises from behind me. And um, I still didn't think anything about it. I'd been in the woods at LBL and had coyotes and the occasional wolf as they were introduced into the park unknowns to the public but they are there and now they've had to admit it and uh as i walked the one thing that really got my hair stood standing up and making me kind of wonder about my safety is as i walked and if i stopped the noise would get silent that's not typical of a coyote or, or any anything in the woods. If if they're out walking, they're they're not going to stop every time that the hunter stops. So I purposely began to walk and then stop all of a sudden. When I was walking, I would catch movement behind me and over to my peripheral vision to the right above a ridge. And then I would stop quickly, very fast, and the movement and the noise would stop. That began to kind of make me wonder what I've got. You know, do I have coyotes? Do I got? Do I have a wolf that's sneaking up on me? I knew that it wasn't a man by the way it was movement, and I knew that it was quadrupedal. So I continued on and thought I'd better get on back to camp because it is getting dark. And uh, above me, about two to three hundred yards out in the woods, I observed some movement. Now this was different than the movement behind me, and this was further up along the trail. And I'm I'm just guesstimating between two or three hundred uh, yards because anyone that's been in LBL knows how dense and how thick these woods are and the undergrowth. So I caught movement and I just kind of kept it in my back of my mind and would watch it. And as I become to get closer to this movement, I actually made eye contact with something something in the woods in front of me and the movement I could see that whatever that it was was actually stepping in and out from behind a very large tree 
So I kept watching this movement. I'm hearing the noise behind me. I'm watching ahead of me. And as I got what I felt to be closer to this object in front of me, it moved, and it it almost like it stood up. And I felt at the time that that it was either a, a man in a ghillie suit or someone dressed in some type of very good camouflage. I could not make out the general shape other than the shape in my mind reg- registering it was very large. It had to be a very large human. So here we go. I'm thinking, okay, now the movement behind me was possibly hunting dogs. And I've come in on a man that is doing some type of hunting, possibly running uh, coon hounds or whatever, just in, in training. And I'm watching behind me. I'm watching in front of me. It's in my vision straight in front of me. And this object, this this possibly hunter in a ghillie suit steps behind a tree and hears my metallic sound for the second time. The metallic sound opens and closes just like some form of a door. It's just hard to understand that I had never heard in all the years I've hunted in my lifetime, I've never heard a noise then or since then that can explain it. This thing disappears in front of my eyes. It's there, but it's not there. Blink of an eye. I'm looking at it. Man, I be to be honest, I rubbed my eyes and I looked hard. Behind me, the noise seemed to creep and get closer. I'm starting to get a little bit uh, leery at this point, not knowing. Everything I'm seeing and hearing just does not register, register to me as a... Uh, hunter in the woods that's experienced I'm thinking it's about time to get on back to camp now as I'm walking and I'm going through the woods I'm beginning to hear I've I've heard the noise with the metal now I'm beginning to hear what I think is possible that it is my partner back in camp either chopping wood or hitting something I'm hearing wood knocks But the one distinct memory I have is the wood knocks did not make sense because they were not in the same area. At one point, they seem like they're coming from where I believe could be coming from my camp, but then all of a sudden I've got a wood knock or some type of noise behind me. Now, the noise that I could describe is a cross between an ax striking something or the possibility of a very large rock being struck against something. So again, I've wrote everything off. I've made the greatest mistakes a hunter could make. I'm writing everything off. I'm trying to be as logical. And the one thing that I was taught is to keep your head in the woods. Most people get into trouble when you lose your head in the woods. So using my navigation skill and everything that I've ever learned, I kept my head about me, and I just kept on my trail, and I eased on back to camp. Closer I got to camp, I could actually smell wood smoke, and I knew I was getting closer. And at this point, it's just almost dark. It's it's in the woods. It actually is dark, even though the atmosphere and outside conditions outside the woods, you still see some light. I approached my camp and I hollered into my camp to let let my hunting partner know that hey, it's me coming in, and he hollers back and. The closer I get to to my hunting partner, Harry, I realize that Harry is visibly shook by something, his his facial expression. When you work with someone long enough that you can almost read their minds and actions, I took one look at Harry and his face. He just did not look right. So uh, looking at him, and I'm thinking, okay, I've upset Harry because I've been gone too long, and so I walk, started walking into the camp and started telling him, hey, man, I'm sorry I've been gone too long. And 
Harry Harry kind of hollers back stern, "Hey, it's not you, man. It's it just something ain't right here." And I said, "What's wrong, Harry?" And uh, he began to explain that he had been out into the corn patch and been hunting in the immediate area within a mile or so of our camp, and he's been harassed. And I said, "Who's harassed you? What's what's going on?" And uh, he began to give me an explanation that. When he would set up and go to call him t- for turkey, that something was being thrown at him, uh, maybe a little pebble or a rock or something, and that he had some, he said some idiot in the woods that kept beating on a tree. And he had made his mind up at that point that we had come into an area where we had evidently excuse the expression but just we had, I'll use this that we had made or, or irritated some other hunters because we had taken their campsite or their hunting area and uh, but in any event he was very very upset and uh, we talked for a few minutes small talk and I told him I'd heard some noises in the woods I wasn't for sure of and I believe the, the two of us at at, at this point in time, we had settled in thinking that, okay, this is our hunting spot. We have chose our hunting spot. Whoever it is out in the woods that's messing with us or upset that we've taken their camp or hunting area, there's enough area in LBL. This is our camp. We're staying. And that's just that's just how it was. I mean, uh, the two of us... I won't say we were alpha males, but we were looking at it that, hey, we was here first, and that's just the way it is. We settled in, and we started a little something on our supper, put the fire up. I pulled off all my equipment, laid it on the ground. Harry was standing in front of the fire, and by this time, there's been a, another hour or two has passed, just small talk and preparing our camp for camp supper. Nothing had transpired at this point. Everything was quiet in the woods, and I, I guess the two of us believed at this point everything was going to be all right and didn't have any other reason to think differently. You didn't have any feelings at all at that time that, that maybe something was going on? Like maybe something was... That did you feel... In, like a lot of times when people go out into the woods and they have this like feeling, you know, like earlier you said that everything was quiet and, and then, you know... Did, was it silent at that time? Like, did you feel like there could have been something about to happen? I don't. I really, when I look back over the years and uh, to my memories that we were almost certainly had become relaxed. We had no, really didn't have any feeling at all. Uh, I believe that one of the areas that, and I look back at this point is because we're both so confident in our abilities and skill that we've faced so many challenges together did nothing too much bother us. However, that is going to change and what the question that you just asked was only just actually moments away of changing. But until that point, there was absolutely no fear, nothing. Katie Dids was singing. There was all kinds of insects going on. Hmm. If I had really put two and two together at this point, I would have known better. But we were just so sure of ourselves. So we're standing in front of our fire, and everything is kind of nonchalant. Everything is just fine. No feeling of dread or anything. But, man, oh, man, was that about to change. Now, for the folks that are listening, I want you to put yourself right there at that campsite, right where I was at. We're we're facing a the cliff behind us, which we felt was sanctuary. We're standing in front of our fire. We're getting ready to eat. Things are just best that could be. LBL when it is dark, it is dark. There's no man-made light. It is as if you step back to the 1700s and you're in the woods and you're primitive. 
that's when your question now will come up. We're standing and we're talking, and the first thing that takes place is we have a small twig or tree limb, just tiny, just something broken off, come off the top of the cliff above us. No big deal again. No big deal. Things drop off. You got widow makers. You got all kinds of things taking place. Happens again. Harry leans over and looks at me, and he's kind of wondering what is going on. And now I'm starting to wonder. Tree limbs hit, small, tiny ones at first. Another one. We begin to look around the camp. We begin to hear things. That's when all the insects get very, very quiet. When the insects get quiet, that's when I began to wonder. To the right of the camp, which would be closer to the to the trace road, a huge cane break and a creek, and that would have been Russian, Russian Creek, I believe is the name of the creek that was beside of our camp. As we are talking among ourselves, we observed what we believed. There was a monster of a tree. I mean, this was a mature tree that was about 30 to 40 yards maximum from our campfire. We saw what we believed was someone standing behind this tree smoking a cigarette as if that person didn't realize or couldn't tell that we could see them. It was as if a man behind the tree was leaning out, peeking at us, and had a cigarette in his mouth because it glowed. And then it would disappear. We started to whisper to one another, and, hey, there's a dude, there's a man behind that tree over there. That must be who it is that has been bothering us. So we just stood there for a moment. It went on again, except this is on the opposite side of the tree. One single glow. One cigarette. That's what we believed. Come back to the other side of the tree. That's when I began to feel that there was something wrong. There was a moment of sense of no insects. Something actually happening here. There's, something's not right. I hollered out, hey, who are you behind the tree? This is not cool to come into a man's camp at nighttime. But there was no answer. No answer, no movement. That's when a rock came off the cliff above us about probably within five foot of us and it dropped between Harry and I right in front of our camp. You heard a noise from the from the rock or orifice up in front of us. You could hear something coming through the trees. You got the picture. There's trees everywhere above us, thick trees. So it comes down, and we hear it flying, and then thug. Huge rock. Huge rock. I, I, no animal threw that rock of, of anything that I know in the woods. Then, as soon as that rock hit, there was a growl. There was a growl a low, intense growl that I've never heard before into the woods coming from exactly beside of that tree. We couldn't see any eyes at this point. No glow from a cigarette. There's nothing other than a growl. And as this intense growl begins to hit, it gets deeper, and I felt the vibration inside of my chest. It was a vibration like you were standing in a rock concert and you were standing too close to amps, but yet the hearing part was low. There was no sound except a small, intense growl. That's when Harry and I both quit talking to each other. We just got still. We got quiet. 
I noticed that my hunting partner wasn't acting right. He was the one closest to the tree. And I look back now that Harry was getting more of an intense feeling from this tree than I was. I'm standing on the other side of him, and I'm frozen. And I'm beginning to feel sheer dread and fear that I have never felt before. And I've seen a lot of bad things. This sheer dread and terror started in, and there was no logical explanation because I hadn't seen anything. All I could do is feel this terror. As as I'm standing there, I'm getting sick to my stomach. I feel like I want to throw up. Harry's beside of me. I see that his shoulders have actually shrugged down and kind of slumped. Now, Harry was a big man, and I've seen a lot of things happen to this man, but I've never seen him scared of anything. No man, no situation. uh, This man was a what I would call a holy terror on the street. He was nice as he could be, but don't cross him in his line of work. I'm seeing a man that his face and his eyes are not looking right, and he's not talking to me, and I can't move. Josh and Barton, you have to understand, going back and even telling this story, I'm sitting in my living room right now, and I can feel every movement and and hear everything. I'm standing there, and I am so frozen. There's there's no explanation for what is taking place. The growling is taking place. The terror is inside of me, and it, it's just the fear is building in me for no reason. At this point is when I see something to the left of me coming from the very trail that I walked in on. My peripheral vision pictured something. I heard it. I could feel it. And it was coming closer to our camp. But there was nothing I could do but just stand there frozen like a child. I cannot explain to you what takes place next or draw a picture for the folks listening. For those hunters out there in the woods that have ever been deep into the woods, there's no reason to feel this. Nothing, no explanation. I'm peering out to the left side of my head, and I see something coming. I'm frozen. I can't move. My legs won't work. I'm sick to my stomach. I feel like I'm going to use the bathroom in my pants. It's the nicest way I can tell you. All of a sudden, I get glimpse of the of the campfire glow, this little bitty tiny kerosene lamp we've got going, and I see this thing. That's the only way of putting it. I see a thing, an object walking in on two legs. I see something about six to seven foot tall, black, hair hanging off of it, skin. I could see skin. When it got closer to the fire and to the ring of the light from this fire, I looked and I could see eyes. And they were dark, black, just black as night eyes. The eyes were not glowing. It was just black, sheer terror. That's when I felt and I knew that whatever this was, it was not it was not human. I don't know if I what I felt at that point. It just came in on me, and I'm watching, and I'm looking at it, and it's looking at me. And the only thing I could do, I, I felt like I was fixing to be its dinner. But that fear, it was almost as if it was toying at me, and it was almost as if it was building my fear level as height and as high as it could get it. The only thing that could come in my mind is something from my my childhood. I began to say a prayer. And as I began to recite a prayer in my head, I felt
felt a little bit stronger or I felt like I could move, but I still couldn't. And I kept saying this prayer in the back of my, in, in, in my head. I felt myself move. As I began to pray, I began to then verbally pray to where I could use my lips. That is something I don't take very lightly, my next move. But I, I, my right arm extended, and I moved, and all of my training kicked in, everything that I'd ever been taught, and all the years of police work, and I withdrew my handgun from my side. When I withdrew my handgun, this creature, this ugly beast thing, it was almost as if it was grinning at me. I pulled my handgun and I pointed it at it. It had some level of intelligence because it stepped backwards. And as it what did it look like, Martin? Can you tell the viewers what it looked like? What, what it looked like? Yes. Okay. What what this beast looked like? I believe was your question, Barton. Yes, this beast correct. was approximately between six and seven foot tall, and it's very hard to understand and tell a good description because of the light. But it did not walk upright like a man would stand straight up. This thing was crouched forward, like it was almost like it was ready to leap. And as it got closer to me and I had pulled my, my firearm, it stepped backwards. So it showed me, now I look back, it had a level of intelligence that it knew what that was in my hand. I remember so definitively that one of its hands had something in its hand in the left arm and hand it had claws but but in its left hand it had what i look back now and i see that it had a piece of meat or it had something in its hand and that's that's what i, I will always believe that it had a piece of meat in its left hand at this point when it when I lowered my my firearm just for a minute to take a better look at this creature, I lowered my weapon. It approached. Now, now was the time that look. I didn't honestly care what it was. I discharged my firearm in its direction. Behind me, when my weapon went off, I felt like it was what we call a. Uh, uh, like a sympathy thing, it's 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 what happens when there's a group of people or two, three police officers together. When one fires, everyone shoots. So my hunting partner behind me, at the same time I shoot, he discharges his double barrel shotgun that I, I believe in the direction of this tree. In the blink of an eye, I have fired and discharged my weapon. This beast flies out of my sight. And when I say fly, I mean it went up the side of this rock cliff. No no human could do this. It was as if it was a mountain goat. I don't know if it touched the wall. I don't know if it jumped and leaped off of it. But just understand that this thing is now out of my sight. It's no longer there. My hunting partner behind me has discharged his weapon, and I immediately began to hear a squeal as if I, I was raised on a farm. It was a cross between hearing uh, a growl or, or a almost like a pig after it had been harmed or had been stuck. It was squealing, and there was all kinds of activity and movement behind that tree. At this point in time, Harry and I, I don't even recall the conversation. We're screaming at each other. He's screaming, let's get let's get out of here. I'm thinking now it's time to exit our camp. It's time it's kind it's time to do a strategic withdrawal. 
I'm still hearing movement to the right of me where this tree was that was something was leaning out that I first thought was smoking a cigarette. Whatever it is, there's two of them. There's two very large something. I, I, I never got a good look at that part. But it's going through the cane break that is beside of the creek, and it is screaming a noise that is so hideous. I cannot even, I couldn't even begin. It, it was just, it was horrid. We began to back up. We ble- we were leaving everything in our camp. At this point, we, we don't care about anything in our camp. We are starting to back up. Harry is basically, he has left me at this point. Harry has made a, a just a straight trot back to his truck. And if I had been wise, that's what I would have done. But I backed up slowly. I'm doing the training thing. I'm doing a tactful withdrawal. I'm looking where the trail was. I'm looking above, above us because I'm hearing something run above our camp on this ridge line where the rock wall was. And then I got over to the right of me. I've got the movement where he fired his shotgun. So I began to back up slowly, and I'm covering our retreat. I hear Harry in the truck. He's got the truck started. I then decide within about 10 to 15 yards of the truck, I turn around and holster and jump into the truck, up into the back end of the bed of the truck. And he's trying to get us going, and his emergency brake is on, and he's he's trying to get us out of there, and he pulls, pops the, the e-brake, and uh, cuts his headlamps on. He's got his headlamps on. That's when I look out into the field in front of me, and to my shock and to my utter dismay, our camp had basically been surrounded. you got whatever beast that come in to the left of our camp, you got something above our camp that was throwing the rock. Then you got whatever was standing behind this tree where the cane breaks are. There's at least two large animals behind that tree. When the headlamps pop on, he throws it in drive. I have just a moment to see visibility with the headlamps approximately one to 200 yards in front of me with the light on across this this corn patch in front of us are two more creatures totally different totally different from what i've seen in my camp where i fired my pistol at one creature in front of the truck the headlamps had caught it and it was standing there and it was not moving it was motionless it would not move, and it to me, for that brief moment that I had in front of my face, this thing was showing no fear and was not shying away from the headlamps. The second one was, the second being standing in front of that truck in the headlamps had crouched down and was laying, almost laying down on top of the grass and the broken down corn that's in this patch. The first one, though, is standing. It's it's at least two foot higher. It's two foot greater than the height of what came into my camp. It's six foot or, or less or more. So you got the difference between the height and these two and what I've seen and what I fired my weapon at is... What I have described to everyone is a wolf-like creature. What I saw standing in front of me at that moment, now please understand, all these things have taken place. I, I've, I've been hit with something I've never understood. I've got tunnel vision from firing my weapon. That, that's when you go into a, a stress mode. Everything is in slow motion. In front of me, I see something that is not supposed to exist whatsoever. And what I see in front of me is totally opposite of what I've seen in my camp. And this thing is eight foot tall. And when I describe this to, to you guys, it's not Harry and the Henderson. This thing is hideous. It is it is ugly. And I'm feeling still feeling the fear and the same dread. So 
that takes place, and I know it's taken me some time to tell you what I see in these headlights. Just imagine that all took place in three to five seconds and imprinted in your mind. Harry throws his truck in, in forward gear and drive, and he's throwing me around in the back of the truck. I'm hanging on to a, a bracket that, that supports some lights above his cab. And I know in my mind we've got a heck of a drive to get out of there. As we are exiting our camp in this truck, I am still seeing movement running now in this cane break, and it is, it's like a, a small tornado that is ripping and tearing down this cane. I've got headlights that are in front of me, but behind me all i got is a campfire. So keep in mind what I'm seeing in my mind and in, in my eyes in the darkness, something is now tearing through my camp and is ripping and tearing up this tent and just throwing stuff. Whatever's in the cane is now coming towards us in the truck, and we've got to come to almost to a complete stop to get out of here. We got a a creek in front of us that in in front of this creek it goes down to what I call a V bottom. You have to go down almost bottom out and then your front end has to come up out of this creek. So Harry hits this creek, the front end strikes. At the same point in time he's hollering and he is screaming, I hear something hit. Something hits the side of our truck. Now my back is to this. I'm looking at the camp. I'm looking at the cane break. He is hollering and screaming. I really can't make out what he says, but I thought at the time that I would find out later. He said, I got one of them. I got one of them. Well, whatever we hit, it hit down the side of our right side of the dry, passenger side of the truck and goes down the side of it. I catch a glimpse of this. Imagine your brake lights, your running lights from your brakes, and I just see a hairy object going down the side of the truck. Okay, imagine what is taking place now, guys. Imagine everything I've described to you and everything that I have seen. The driver of this pickup truck, Harry, is now at Dukes and Hazard getting out of there, and we've got to travel out gravel and dirt road and get out onto the trace. He hits the trace flying. Hits a trace running, and I'm beating the cab of the truck to let me into the truck. He finally comes to a stop, lets me get out of the bed of the pickup truck and get inside to the passenger side, and he takes off. He is heading out of the trace, and he does not want to stop, pass, go, collect $200 or anything. He's, he, at this point, he's wanting to get out of Dodge. My instinct is to report, report, report. And my training has been an incident takes place, you report. So we fly towards the uh, towards the uh, South Welcome Station is what it's called, but it's actually the, the, the what I call the guard shack, but it's more uh, a word that's a little softer for civilians. It's the it's the welcoming station, and uh, we're headed to that. And when we get there, uh, we have a uh, one of the two door, uh, like a Cherokee Jeep, the old 1990s model, where it's just two doors on them, and it's a marked unit. But there's nobody in the shack. Martin, was this in the south end or the north end? Can you tell the audience that? that? Yes, that would be the south end at this point. We have come to the south check station at the edge of LBL uh, to where the trace actually comes out and exits the park. And we're sitting in the south check station in the parking lot, and I'm having to now, uh, and, and I know that Harry would not mind me telling this, but I'm having to deal with an individual. Harry is at this point, it's time to get the heck out of here. Don't report this. Let's just we're we're alive and let's get out of here. I was the total polar opposite. No, no, we can't leave. We got to find somebody. Harry 
he is visibly messed up. There's something has happened to my partner. He is not his self. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing this. So what we decided to do, or what I actually insisted on him doing, that we're going to stay somewhere within the park. And we exited the South Check Station, and we started towards the North Station at this point. Now, we've come a few miles from where we were at. So we head back in the same direction, and we're headed to trying to get to an area. We figure that the North Check Station is not going to be any different than the South one. And we didn't even know in 1993 if the other station would even be open. It would be the old one. And so we made a decision. We pulled off the side of the road, uh, get ourselves straight, and we're going to sleep in the truck for the night. Um, Harry, for whatever reason, was a lot worse off than I was, and he was very sick. He was experiencing a whole lot of stomach stomach problems and issues, and he lay down in the cab of the pickup truck that night, and I slept on the top of the truck, and that's not even a good way of saying it. I stayed on the truck in a, in a dazed dream the rest of the night until we started getting some light. So that was that was our night until the next morning. Harry and I did not speak of it, did not talk until the following morning when he finally was able to arise and get up. So, so Martin, now the just so the story. audience knows, can I ask you a question before you continue, please, Martin? Yes, Just Martin. so the audience knows, just so they know what you're talking about, the first creature you saw, you said it was wolf-like, it had a wolf-like head? Yes. Now, the two creatures in the headlights, they were not the same. They were more like Bigfoot, would you say? The two creatures that was in the headlight was to totally opposite of what walked into our camp. The creature that was in the camp that had come in on my trail and that I fired my firearm at was wolf-like, and we have, you and I have, have spoken uh, in the past, <laughs> The head and its ears was almost identical to one of your drawings that you you drew in, I believe, 2003 or whatever that drawing was was made. Right. It had hair on its ears. Uh, it had canine teeth, and and I didn't really do an accurate description for you right there. I just when I fall into this mode, I just tell it as I'm I'm actually reliving that, and it's. To be honest, Barton, it's very hard. It doesn't go away. But the creature, right. the creature that I saw had hair on its ears. They were short ears and had a very short snout. And it, honestly, as it was approaching me, it was almost as if it was grinning. It, it was. It, it to me, I look back. It was trying to instill as much fear within me as it could. Now, the creatures in the headlights, the two Bigfoot looking, that it's not stereotypical of, of Harry and the Henderson, but it was more of a, a more fierce looking uh, Bigfoot that its face was not completely flat, but its skin was black, and its eyes did not glow either. There was no glow to its eyes. Uh, it was dark eyes. And it showed no fear. It, it, I don't believe that it. It knew that I, whatever I was doing, was not going to harm it whatsoever, Barton. Right. So we have Bigfoot and Dogman working together. It sounds like to me he's, he was coming back to camp, and you hear the whistles and the the rock throwing and all that. And you asked me uh, days ago what I thought was going on if, if the Bigfoot. I thought the Bigfoot creatures were trying to protect you, and I'm, I'm saying, hell no, they no. were working together, trying to get you killed is what I think. So it sounds but, to me like the, the Bigfoot were calling the dog man in on you. The, the, the issue and the problem that I had at that time, Barton, and I think you will be able to recognize this, is the old group think that, Bigfoot is Harry and the Henderson and is not going to harm anyone, but 
looking back and uh, please get in the same frame of mind that I had in in 1993. I was naive and did not even believe in these existence. So I look back now and this group think issue that we have going on here across the nation is that oh Harry ain't gonna hurt you but in fact those noises I heard in the woods and the whistles and the and I don't think I got that down good because I'm looking back that I didn't get that in that we had whistles in the woods as long, as well as the metallic noises this Bigfoot was calling and was directing these animals that was in the woods with me and they were hunting me they were stalking me why they didn't get me in the woods I do not have a clue other than maybe they thought we would have a a, a, a nice TV dinner with two instead of one but the Bigfoot was actually it was it was directing these animals yeah that's, and that, that's not real. out of the uh, that's not unusual like I've heard stories like that before and Barton has too um, these things they're not your friends uh, I wish the old guard would, would, would stop with this nonsense about giving them apples and tobacco and uh, on Saturday's show if you go back and listen to Saturday's show I, I, I read some examples of real, real bad naivety in these dogman Bigfoot groups um, talking about letting dogmen eat with their children and they're walking, holding their hands and singing songs. I thought that these people were, were, were playing around, but they were being serious. They really were saying these things. And I'm like, if you're saying these things and you're just making it up, well, just know that your lies are putting people at risk. And if you really believe that these things, that that's you're saying that these things, and you think that that's what happened in your mind, then it sounds like a bad case of schizophrenia. I mean, you know, I just, and, and, and that's just, you know, not to interrupt for too long, Martin, but th th this is not oh, no, something no, I, unusual. I, I, I wanted to hear that because I wanted someone else to to uh, be on the same guideline as I was in thought pattern that these things are not our friends. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I have, from that point in time, I can look back now and I am totally in the same thought that, this my eyes in gorilla suit man that turned out to be a Bigfoot in the field in front of me. He was the director. He was the person calling everything. It was as if he was a hunter. And those wolf canine creatures at my feet were his hunting dogs like I would be quail hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and another it's thing, amazing. too. Very amazing. Another thing too, like if you if you look at some of the cases that I've covered, and I've gone over some of these with Barton too, um, of the cloaking and the uncloaking. Somebody just mentioned that, which made me think about that. Why is it that we get stories of both of these species of creature, whatever they are? Um, why do we get stories of both of them cloaking? Uh, there have been people who have seen this happened at, right on the road to Laredo in Texas. I just got one not too long ago. A guy claims to have seen on, on one trip, uh, he, he was driving into Laredo to visit his family and he saw something that went across the road on all fours. It looked like wolf-like and then got up at the end, but it looked almost like a pixelated uh, image of something that was cloaked. And then one day he was driving back to that same area and he saw two, two what he could only describe as Bigfoot or Sasquatch-type creatures, one that looked male and one that looked female, but they were standing on the side of the road. And he said they looked menacing. And, you know, it was like just two days later. I mean, like on the way on the way there, he saw this dogman, wolf-looking creature. And on the way back, he saw two Bigfoot. The same place. Same exact spot. So maybe they come from a, a portal. They come from the same area. Um, I've heard of dogmen seemingly being used as mercenaries uh, for mantis type creatures. Um, mm -hmm. I've said it before. I mean, there's a lot of weird stuff connected to this, and there's this old uh, thought process that, that shames anyone who says anything that, that goes out of the. Oh, these people are kooky. You know, well, the rest of the world thinks we're all kooky, so it doesn't matter. Um, I don't know why they have such a hard time swallowing the truth. They think that everybody's just making up stories 
And like I said, you could pray to a thousand people in front of them and tell them that these are not your friends, that they're not, you know, and they just wander out into the woods and be like, oh, I'm cool, you know. If I run across Bigfoot, you know, like, you could just go missing, too. I mean, you know, that happens quite a bit. Right. The missing part definitely comes in, and we see this now with all the the different individuals, whether if it's in our national parks or in our state recreational areas that are deemed that instead of a, a national park. And that goes hand in hand. Now, now I, I do want to, to clarify something that you, you have brought up that I, I want to make certain that everyone understands tonight. Uh, as I'm telling this story, my wife will tell you, and she confessed this out to, actually to... Uh, Joe and Jesse of Hell of Hell Ben Holler, hello. which hello hello to Hell Ben Holler and and glad you're with us tonight. But my wife explained to them that I relive this every day. This is something that does not go away and it does not uh, does not disappear. And there's nothing that can be done. There's nothing that takes it away. But when I was talking earlier tonight, I am so sorry, folks, that I did not mention. The one thing that was, a, there's a couple key th issues, and that I didn't get into there, that when I was in the woods, that this creature, that I look back now, that is was Bigfoot, was whistling for these animals. There was whistles everywhere. And my hunting partner, Harry, when he was in the cornfield, he told me in the camp when I had come back, that whatever had been throwing objects at him, that he had become extremely irate about it because someone was whistling and it was it was getting to be uh, very irritating not only to him but to his ears because it was such a shrill whistle. And I just wanted to point that out for everyone. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Martin, for doing that. So what you're describing here is a direct parallel to what happened to me and my family back in 1975, where you have two different types of inhumanoids uh, mm -hmm. occupying and working whatever they do in the same place at the same time. So I've been waiting for 20 years to have someone like you come around and have something similar happen to him. It's just outstanding. Martin, can you tell us what happened the next morning to that bow hunter? Yes, yes. So, as I left off, we were talking about that uh, Harry and I had found a nice place to... I actually chose a nice little place on top of a hill in an open field of about 200 acres where there was a TVA uh, power line so that I could see in all areas around our pickup truck that night. And uh, so, we spent the night... I, I, I stayed on top of the truck the rest of the night with my shotgun, and because I, you know, I'm reliving all this, and Harry's in the in the seat below me, underneath the cab, and he's trying to sleep. And um, my old buddy is is very sick. I mean, he's very sick. But we wake up the next morning and uh, we get her going, and the first thing that occurs, we're standing outside. You're doing what you're doing when you wake up in the morning, and we take a look. <laughs> our pickup truck. Harry's truck is tore up all down the side, the right-hand side of the truck, and we will bring this to the attention of some people here shortly. And Harry's truck has got claw marks, distinct claw marks that come down the side of his right side of the bed. Now, Harry had a big three-quarter ton pick -em up truck. And uh, you got these huge claw marks that come down the side where he indeed, I don't know if he if he actually struck it or it struck the truck. So keep that in mind. So we get our stuff together and we're taking a look at whatever had happened to his pickup truck. And we jump in and we decide to head on back down to the south check station. Now, just before we left our area, we had seen several vehicles that was out on the trace and they were marked patrol units and they were heading up going towards the Kentucky side and that's that's all we knew we had seen a lot of activity early that morning before we left and got going so 
we're headed to the South Czech station. We don't have any other thoughts other than Harry is still insistent we're just going home, and I'm insistent that we're going to the South Czech station. So as we approach the South Czech station, the first thing I notice is all the activity down there. To our amazement, there are two, possibly three, and a lot more other huge trucks and vans. And as we got closer, these are news media vehicles. These are television mobile units that are parked uh, along to the side and in the parking lots. And in the parking lot of the South Check Station, it is full. We've got, you, you keep in mind now that old Bubba here was a policeman, so I'm, I, I go through vehicles very quickly in my mind. we got unmarked units. We have marked units. We have some, uh, we have one vehicle that had dogs on it. And, uh, just a whole flurry of people at the at the check station. Now you can imagine what's going through Harry's mind. Harry's wanting to leave. He does not want nothing to do with this. So he parks the the truck, and I go stumbling in. And uh, I slowly approach, and I'm keeping my eyes open, watching all this. And there's a whole lot of news reporters that's standing in a group, and they're they're not approaching the the HQ or the check station. They're standing over, and they're talking with a uniformed officer. I walk up, walk in, and I explain to them that we'd had something that occurred in our camp, and I wanted to report it. And uh, immediately I was shuffled off to the side and told to not speak, that we would go in privately and talk. Well, first I was carried back to uh, a small office, and then I was taken outside and to the side where there was no one at. And I began to tell my story. And I could I could tell that the person I was speaking of, we're just going to use the word officials, that my story was not well received and uh he wanted to see all my identification they wanted to take a look at our firearms and they went and did the same they they kept harry and i separated to get our stories separately and uh the official explained to me that just to the basics of that uh i had been uh a little mistaken and he felt like I had over overreacted and wanted to know if this was my first time in the park and what my experiences had been in the past and that I had just overreacted it was probably a uh, some type of other animal until he heard the entire story when I broke down and told my entire story to this individual, he told me that uh, he began to get really upset and tell me that, well, now we've got you basically that we've had uh, reports in the park that of a rogue bear with mange that had been harassing campers a few miles from us and that uh, that is what I'd probably shot at. And he was very upset and accused us of everything from poaching bears to uh, it got down to that we had firearms in the park we weren't supposed to have. But an argument was made and all of our credentials was filed with him and he held us there for quite some time. And while we were there, Harry was able to slip back and talk to me and he was told by the ranger that someone had gotten hurt in the park and that that that's why the news crews was there and I wasn't told anything at first until I demanded to know what was going on and he explained that they had been someone hurt in the park that it was really none of my affair and that my incident could not be tied into that by any reasoning and he would not come he wouldn't come clean with me at all as to what had taken place in the park now here's where the story turns now, let me explain to you a little bit about my, just a little bit about who I was. Uh, from a perspective, I had been a police officer in this state for many years and actually had been president of the Fraternal Order of Police 
in uh, in my county and a delegate to the national convention many times. So I knew just about every trooper and police officer, not in, in the entire state, but I was well known and people knew me. And I certainly knew a couple of folks that actually showed up at this South Check station. Not of the park rangers, but there was a state trooper present. There was two deputy sheriffs from the adjoining county. One of them was actually on a uh, canine assistant or a uh, a search team. And they began to talk to me, which visibly upset the official I was speaking to, and he didn't want me to talk to him at all. He gave me a warning about speaking to anybody and telling anybody anything. But while we're standing there, one of my little buddies, one of my friends that knew me, had told me a man had actually been killed in the park last night. And that uh, two turkey hunters... Now, keep in mind, folks, because you're going to hear a lot of stories about this. But you've got a, a... Hunter killed in 91, 93, 97, 99, or 2000, and then one has been killed in 2004. Now, the one in 93, the story goes as this. Two turkey hunters had been walking as a pair and had stumbled in to a man's camp and found his camp tore to pieces. They didn't find anything at first, but then they found something in the field. And the story goes differently from one ranger to the next. But what we discovered was that someone had been killed, in fact. So the story goes further. We're standing there. We're doing all this talking. Here comes a... Uh, older model. This is 1993. Here comes a tow truck. And guys, I would have just absolutely died when I looked and I saw the pickup truck being hauled in and behind this tow truck. This tow truck was actually hauling the very same truck of the man that I had met in the woods on a gravel road. And this, this was this firefighter I had spoken to. It was his truck. Believe me, a police officer doesn't make the mistake about seeing certain tags and seeing stickers on windshields or seeing a man's truck up close. That's, we're, we're trained to be observant. So I got visibly upset, and I tried to tell the folks that I had met this gentleman the day before. Long story short, Harry and I were shuttled out of the out of the area, told not to speak to the media. We had been basically threatened to be charged with uh, bear hunting for a bear that's not even supposed to exist in LBL in 1993, and told that we were could be charged with poaching bears. At one point. The official and I were screaming, doing a screaming match together, and I was told to take my credentials and to leave his park and not return. And I had the same feelings and sentiment that I would be glad to leave his presence and not return and bless his heart. So that's how the story went. You said it just like that, too, didn't you? <laughs> yes, I, and I and I did, I did, sir. I, I, I at this point, I could tell some stories about my career. I, I can, I can uh, describe a situation to someone that, when I'm in utter disgust, I, I have my way with words. Brian, you have a way of words for sure. So, Martin, I wanted to say something here. Um, one of the people that's in the chat tonight, Juan Arturo Mota, uh, uh, he is a friend of mine. He was in the front row listening to this. Um, you your, your speak at the conference, and I got a chance to talk to him. He's been on my show, and one thing that happened to him was he interrupted what was a ceremony or some sort of, like, I don't know what you would call it. It was something... You know, a group of people, where they weren't just out there in the woods just hanging out chanting. No, there was something going on. And he heard screams and growls and howls and all kinds of stuff. And we covered this on, on the podcast. 
um, mm -hmm. and I'm convinced that he he interrupted something, you know. And I've interviewed a guy, and Barton, we might have discussed this case too, who was a tow truck driver who arrived. Um, I know me and Bettina talked about it when she was on my show, and he was a very large African American man, and the police came, and they were just like, okay, go ahead and leave, get out of here. You know, they 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 were not interested in him as a possible suspect of the dis of the disappearance of this particular tow truck driver. Mm -hmm. Like he mm -hmm. showed up after someone had dis had been called and these people were dis had disappeared and he showed up and they were just like, oh, don't worry about it, just go ahead and leave. Like you know, um, like. After someone, uh, what I'm saying is like someone had, had been missing, they had gone missing, there was blood, he saw blood all over the vehicle, he saw uh, what might have been a shoe with a foot in it, wasn't 100%, and somebody had been killed, obviously ripped apart, and it looked like they had, there was a blood trail going into the woods, and they show up and he he's there, and the other tow truck driver's gone, and they don't even look at him as a suspect, they just tell him to leave. So that's yeah. very yeah. odd, very weird. That's not police work. I mean, you know, um, and, yeah. and we discussed it too. I mean, you know, it's like, dude, you would have been, they would have nailed you. I mean, you would have been like there. They would have wanted samples of your DNA, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. They didn't ask yeah. for anything. They just told him to leave. And these, these two guys were kind of directing everything, and they were dressed in black and white suits. And they just basically told him, just they told the police, tell him to get out of here, you know, whatever. Um, so, you know, I mean, you got these weird things that go on in the area that, 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 that Arturo had his weird encounter with those beings. I've gotten stories out of that area. Uh, it was, it was a park around close to Austin, you know, uh, of people saying that they've seen weird, like wolf like creatures. They've seen Bigfoot in the same area or kind of like two different sides, really. And but still the same general area, you know. It was at uh, uh, a, a, a forested area here, you know, near Austin. And Juan, if you, if, if you could refresh my memory, put put the, uh, the 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 year that it happened. I don't remember if you're on there listening, uh, Arturo. Put the year that it happened on there, and it was near, it was Pedernales, uh, I believe it was Pedernales State Park. And these people, the rangers in the in in this place, they they directed him to this spot, like almost like they knew that that was going on there, and they sent him there, which was even more disturbing. And it's like if if anybody can sit here and convince me that these people don't know what's going on, I, I'm not going to sit here and get all conspiratorial tonight. Because, but I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of people that know a lot more about what's going on than what they're letting on. Um, yes, they are. Sure, they do. Mm -hmm. Because I've talked to police, you know, in this area, different and different police, you know, um, from different, uh, cert, you know, sheriff's deputies. I've talked to a couple of them when I was working in South Austin and at this project we were doing, uh, and he was talking to me about shapeshifters. Um, he sat there and told me and my brother. My brother's in the chat right now, and, and we we got to know him. He's a former Marine, and he he said there was a lot of weird stuff in that area. Um, we've talked to, to uh, a, a police officer that, that worked for the Colorado River, whatever, authority, and um, claimed to have had an encounter. And me and my mm -hmm. brother interviewed him. Uh, we were at a coffee shop. And then we had a drink at a bar, you know, because he was just so rattled, you know. So we took him and, and we had him a drink, gave him a drink, you know, and he was just, he couldn't sit down. I mean, you know, he, he had infrasound that struck him. Um, and that area prior to that, his brother had seen a Bigfoot in that same exact spot near that, that, uh, spot where he had his encounter. Um, so these things do inhabit the same area and even weirder to add to the weirdness. There's a camping area about not even a quarter mile up the road from where this officer had his encounter. Um, he lost his weapon. Like, he ended up leaving it at the scene. I mean, I can't really blame the guy, you know, and he he relieved himself because it was so, you know, whatever. And then mm -hmm. th at that campsite, there was a goat man story. I believe that was on the first episode of this show, which is the audio is horrible. <laughs> and, and it took us like, an, you know, an hour for every 10 minutes, it seemed like an hour, you know, because we were trying to figure out what we were doing. But 
there was a goat man encounter that that these people, these college girls, kids or whatever, but there were two girls in particular who had this encounter with this goat man like creature. And so people think, oh, you know, they're not they're not you know, it's they're not connected or you know, they they have some sort of like different rivalry or whatever. That may be in some cases, but it may not be too. I mean, even gangbangers can put their differences aside and work together for criminality. I've seen it happen. Certainly, certainly. I mean, so it's, you know, pe- people that poo-poo, like, oh, they think that these things aren't in the same area with each other or their their territories don't overlap. And I still believe that these things are some form of, um, like, Nephilim or something that, that was a holdover. Um, I believe that the government gets a hold of them. Uh, and weaponizes them. I still believe that that's a very real possibility. I don't know what branch government is a shadow government. I don't know. Could be anything. But yes. a- another thing I believe too is that these things have been here for a very long time, and they have a metaphysical quality to them that we can't comprehend. And I really believe that it's it's in people's best interest to to know what you're dealing with when you go out into the woods. And I think your story is a cautionary tale to anybody um, that these things, you know, they're out there. Uh, and I, people that they, they, they want to argue with me all the time about what they are, what they aren't, and, and they'll start an argument with me not even knowing that I'm still open to any and all suggestions because we're still trying to figure it out. Um, but right. I can, you know, that's what I, we're doing. We're searching for the truth here. Mm hmm. We're not searching exactly. for Exactly. We have to have open minds. And that's where we as, as, as a whole, not the three of us, but others who have this same, and this, this word has just been sprung on me recently, but this group think or this think tank that they're on one side of land between the lakes or they're on this side of land between the lakes or the goat man doesn't uh, reside on this side of Texas. It only goes across on this side. And the group think that, that we... Uh, certain animals do not harm you. Certain animals uh, will protect you. It, it, it's we've got to have an open mind as to the evidence and the answers we seek. Right. Yeah. We have to follow the evidence where it leads, not where we want it to lead. And Martin, I just want to tell you, it's so much better sitting here listening to you tell the story in great detail and at length, but you know, you didn't have a lot of time down at the conference, but now you're telling us all these details that you weren't able to uh, tell us there. So you said your buddy Harry got sick that night. I wanted to ask you, did your buddy ever recover from that night? That is a good question. I'm glad we were able to bring that out. And I also, for the first time tonight, I actually had glanced over and I had read a couple of the, the different questions. Let me answer your question and add to what happened to my friend Harry. Um, I didn't tell a lot tonight about Harry and what had happened to him. He got he got sick. He did he did relieve himself in his pants and had two changes his clothes and as well as I did and uh we we had a pretty rough time in in whatever affected us but now this is this is what happens after we're told to leave land between the lakes uh eventually I ended up having to drive Harry and I drove Harry all the way back home to the area of Springfield Tennessee Harry was very sick and was notably, as the hours passed, he became a lot sicker. And Harry's physical appearance would have been someone that I'd noticed I've been trained. We've all been trained for medical side of this. And he began to get really ghastly white and I couldn't talk him into going to any emergency room or anything at the time. He just wanted to go home and be with his wife and family. I get him home, we get him into the house, and um, unfortunately that'd be the last time that I would see Harry for some time. But here's what took place at this time. Uh, We get him home, I go on back home, and the Monday comes, and as soon as Monday morning comes, 
I get word to return to the sheriff's office and report to duty, but to report to the sheriff itself. And I had walked in, and they had already, uh, the sheriff had already received word that day while I was standing there. And I had known that the officials had contacted uh, my department and wanted to speak with the sheriff. But when I went in that Monday morning, the sheriff told me that uh, Harry indeed had had a either a heart attack or some type of a stroke and was very sick. And he did not know at that, at that time what was going to take place. But Harry had basically passed on to him that he may not be returning to work. And eventually that's what took place within just a few days. Harry resigned from the sheriff's office. He indeed had had a stroke. And um, I would find out that Harry, uh, his hands, he couldn't tr control his hands after this stroke. And he would visibly shake as if it would be noticeable, like almost like Alzheimer's or, or something to where that you can't control your movements of your hands. They just physically would shake. And uh, eventually, uh, Harry would just totally disappear from my life for quite some time and from public life. He just stayed at home, and he, he ended up uh, very sick. And um, the question that I saw also in the chat room is what, what happened to Harry and, and what would Harry say? Here's what happened to Harry. Harry dropped out. Uh, we did not speak for a long time for a lot of reasons. Uh, mentally, he was affected the rest of his life. But he had made me give a promise that I would never speak of this story because of the ridicule, and he did not want his family to know what had taken place. And I kept that story. I kept that promise to that man until he passed away. But before he passed away, he expressed to me that almost on his deathbed that I could tell our story, but he wanted his family to remain from the ridicule, which is obvious, and he did not want his family to have to face this after he was gone. And I have hidden his identity, and I've hidden the story until now. And Harry wanted me to tell the story, but to protect his family. And that's what I have done, and I will, I will certainly keep that promise to him. Now, many folks back home have approached me and attempted me to talk, and some have actually figured it out. Most of the officers I have worked with have quit or have died. There are some old old timers like me still alive, and they've halfway figured it out who he was. But I'll not look them in the eye and say who it was. So I, I wanted to say something, Angelo Jeffries. I wanted to address his comment. He said these national parks are practice grounds for the government yard dog. What do you think of that? Um. That would basically what he's saying that it's the practice or the hunting zone of their guard dogs mm -hmm. of these creatures. I mean, they're, they're, they're yes, I, I do believe that. I believe mm -hmm. that not only do they know, and and here's my heartfelt belief: these animals are tracked, they're tagged, they know where they're at, they know what is taking place. Um, it would be a good time if we have the time. I will go forward in a few minutes, only if you tell me I can, and I will tell some of the things that I know. But I truly believe in his statement. They are the training grounds of these animals and whatever project that this is. And real quick, Sharon Lane says, I saw some strange things on the west side of Lake Travis. Yes, Absolutely. I've been out there many times, and I have gotten some crazy stories on the west side of Lake Travis. I was just out there the other night doing some investigating, and I've interviewed lots of people who've seen weird things. Um, I wanted to a address a couple of different things here on, on that are people are asking questions. If you have questions for it, Juan, did you give me the, the year that that happened to you in Pedernales? Because I... I it, yeah, it, it, um, I wanted to get his, his the year that it happened to him over there because it seemed almost like they were setting him up, you know, and if you listen to that episode of the podcast, it's crazy. 
it's a two-parter i believe with with juan and arturo and um i, I i've gotten the so many stories team. Do what? Yeah, the dance. Yeah, he the danced with Juan, Letitia. Yeah, the, the dancing yeah. king. Yeah. Yeah, he was, a, he was dancing at the, at the conference. So, um, one of the things I was going to say, too, is people try to tell me, well, you know, how can these things be metaphysical and be, be weaponized or whatever? These things can manifest as physical and be, you know, spiritual beings. And me and Barton talked about this last night with Josh. We were on the phone with Josh and Nokio for hours talking last night. And one of the things that came up was my conversations with Linda Godfrey. And one of the things me and Linda talked about in private, and we may have discussed it on the show too, because she did like a two or three parter with me on the show. Um, she she brought, brings up a good point. She's like, these things, when they enter our, our world, and I'm going to explain to you my theory on this, is that when they come from the fourth dimension, fourth density, whatever you want to call it, um, mm-hmm. they are a sort of spiritual, half spiritual, half physical being. Okay? So in other words, we're in the third dimension here. Where we live in the third density, we are completely solid. There's flesh and blood. The vibrating atoms, they, they, they're they real close together. It's, it's a science thing, right? Well, in the fourth density, fourth dimension, whatever you want to call it, they are sort of an in-between zone. In other words, Austria is in between Germany and Italy. And guess what? Austria is kind of like a mix of the two. Just like Belgium is in between Germany and, and, and France, it's kind of like a mix. It's got German language and, and French language and Dutch language, and it's kind of like an intermediate. There is no Belgian language. It's just an intermediate country, kind of a meeting point, if you will. That's what the fourth density is. It's an intermediate state. When you travel astrally out of your body or whatever happens, if you come out of your body, um, you will end up more than likely in the fourth level you know, it's been said that these 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 really evil entities cannot go beyond the fifth level, fifth density, because that goes into heaven once you go sixth, seventh, whatever. Now, what I'm what I'm explaining to you, it also coincides with dimensions, like the the, the string theory. Uh, Michi Kaku is a good one to listen to. Um, there are eleven dimensions, and he talks. You know, at one time we were like, "There's nine. Now they're saying there's eleven. Um, but each of these. Uh, universes because i believe we have parallels have 11 dimensions and if you go into the fourth density you will see ghost like images that look like they are spirits but they resemble a a fleshly being whereas once you go to the fifth level it's just you're just a ball of light and that's all that's there and every you know and if you're in that fifth level you're seeing in all directions and you are just a ball of light now you'll see that too in the fourth level but the fourth level these creatures, they, they come into our world, I think they slowly begin to adapt and become us, like us, like flesh. They need to eat, they need to sleep, they need water, they need have they need uh, shelter, all that. But I, I, I interviewed a rancher up in Wyoming who shot one of these things coming out of what can only be described as a portal. And it was about 20 feet from it, and it began to run toward him, and he and, and he shot it point blank, and all that happened was f- f- fur and, and some dust came off of it. It looked bizarre, but it stopped it. And then it kind of was like kind of thinking about it, and I guess it just decided to go back into the portal. Now, I talked to this guy. Two or three weeks later, he sees another creature that may, have been, may or may not have been the same one, and when he shot it, there was blood. Now, you tell me what that means, okay? And I'm trying to get this guy to, to, to come and maybe tell his story, but he, he didn't kill it, but he shot it. Now, why would one of them bleed and the other one wouldn't, or the same creature not bleed coming out of the portal, but then it bleeds after two or three weeks? Think about it, folks. I mean, it, it, it's becoming more, you know, like if you were to go into the fourth level, you would have to become more spirit. That's why I think that there's this ectoplasm that's left behind from these entities at times where, where there's this goo, because it's like a plasma type state of being. Now, it says in the Quran, when it talks about the jinn, it says that they have neighbors. Like there's us, and then there's them, and then they have neighbors. So there's, a, there's another type of entity that lives on, in another plane from them, and they exist a right angle from a right angle. Now, if you start thinking about demons and ghosts and angels and whatever, they all reside on a different plane of existence from us. 
and it, they can see everything that we can see plus you know and whatever because they're hidden from us because the word actually means hidden ones jinn means to hide it means hidden and so what i'm getting at is these things could seriously be manifested demonic entities and this is just a theory right because i can't prove it you have to test these theories but they can actually be manifested beings that once they've been here and they've become more flesh, and some of the me and Linda had talked about multiple times, then when they become more flesh, then they can be grabbed and harnessed and tagged and turned into weapons. Because I still believe, and I said this at the conference, that I believe that the Anunnaki created them to, to watch us, to make us as slaves. Now, somebody asked me what the Anunnaki looked like. I said they were giants. Go read the book of Enoch, and you know Genesis six that it talks about them. Enoch is the long version of that. Now the question came up in a chat one time. They said, "Well, why why wouldn't they just make us? If they if they made us in their image, why wouldn't they just create a slave race?" Uh, and I said, "Because think about it. If you created something this tall, wouldn't it be a lot easier to control than something your own size if it gets out of hand?" And you know, and I basically made a kicking motion, and I said, "You know." Psh, that's what happens when it gets out of hand. And on stage, I said that, you know, and people laughed, but it was the truth. You know, you would make a smaller version of yourself that you could control. If I was a mad scientist and I was creating slaves in, in, in test tubes, I'm not going to make something my size that can get out of control. I'm going to make like little dudes, you know, little monitos or duendes, as they would call them in Spanish. And I would just have a bunch of Smurfs running around doing my bidding. What happens when they get out of hand? You just squash them. If you're evil, which, you know, a lot of the the, the, the Anunnaki and their descendants were, obviously. Now, that doesn't take away from the, the fact that there is a God, and the God Most High and His Son Jesus Christ was sent here to save us from all this. That doesn't take away from that. People think that that, that, that theory it trumps all that and then that you become that whatever. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, what I am saying, is that all this can fit together. It, it's like, how does this all fit? It's a puzzle. Well, it is a puzzle. But think about it like this, it, folks, are listening at home, and then we'll get back to Martin and we can ask some questions. Say that you walk up to a, a painting. Don't even pay attention to the painting. Just walk up and get as close as you can and take a look at it. Take a step back, and then you're like, oh, what is that? Looks like some sort of hoof or like a horse's leg or something. You back up again, you're like, oh, it's the rear part of a horse. You back up even further, it's like, oh, it's a horse. It's a guy on a horse. Then you back up even further and you see it's a battle scene. It is it is a cavalry, you know, clashing. You don't know that because you're, you're right up against it and all you're getting is this little piece right here of the puzzle. Until you step back and you take in the entire mosaic with all the pieces together, you're going to be lost. You're going to think this is what it is and because you got this little shard of a piece. When in reality, it's this huge mosa panoramic mosaic that you're, you're, you're trying to, to uncover and trying to decipher. And for whatever reason, whether it be through jealousy, envy, you know, just whatever... There are all these people that have all this time and, and, and money invested in this narrative that none of this is real. It's all just, there's either a flesh and blood creature out there running around, or there's not. And that is a very dangerous narrative because you're not dealing with just a flesh and blood creature. We are told by Christ, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with the spirit. Yeah. Now, if, if these things were purely physical, he would be warning us about the purely physical creatures, and he's not. He's telling us that there's there's a spirit spiritual warfare going on. When you enter into this battle and you accept Christ, you're raising a flag. As my friend Josh, and we talked about it last night, Bart, remember? Um, you're raising your flag, and you're saying, this is the team that I'm on. And then, you know, you're protected. But you also have to do your part. There is spiritual warfare that's going on. And I think that these people have taken it to the next level. Just like I said earlier about they go up there and they think they're God. Because I say they're God because their God is not my God. Just like Jesus told the Pharisees, your, your father is not my father. Your father is Satan. He's like, my father is the one most high. Well, they're going up there and they're thinking they're God. Who's the one behind all of it? You know, that, that's that's what I believe. 
because that's what they're doing and these creatures are just more they're just part of the overall plan uh, somebody says dogmen are all Greek mythos was created by Nephilim because they meant to corrupt flesh. Yes. And somebody asked me, they said, well, when the Greeks were worshiping Zeus and, and, you know, they had all these demigods and they had all this, uh, Apollo and they had all these different types of, of things going on, Poseidon, um, Hades, they said, w was that, were those the Nephilim? I said, yes and no. Yes. In the way that those gods they were the remnants of the of their ancestral memory the ancestors of the greeks i believe were around those gods those little g gods but they weren't around them like by the time of thermopylae and the, you know the wars with persia they weren't around anymore those gods were long gone they were imprisoned like they're supposed to be because they committed horrible sins and they took the earth like it was theirs and so what ends up happening is that they were, were following the traditions of their ancestors, that the gods resided on Mount Olympus, and we, we consulted the oracle, and you had all this other stuff going on. But it was over. That was during the time of the Dwarpa Yuga, if you look at the Hindu uh, belief in the Yugas, and I do believe that part of the Vedas. So what ends up happening, these gods or whatever, they're gone, they're, they're imprisoned. It says that they're, they, they will be imprisoned as long as the earth shall endure. It says in the book of Enoch. But they still had the memory of these gods, and they were still serving them. They were pagan. They didn't really know, you know. But I'm telling you right now, these creatures come in and out of the fourth level, and, and they can see us way better than we can see them. And once they're here and they become more physical... Because you can't survive, just you have to have food and whatever to, to ma manifest yourself as physical. They're being used. And I think that, that some of these things may even be genetically created and then given spare souls of the Nephilim. And I think that they kill people. I absolutely think that. I think that they hurt people. I think they chase people. They try to drag people out of their vehicles. And every time, without fail, it's some sort of, oh, it's a dog attack, or it's this, or it's that. It's a bear. They love The bear thing, they love to say it's a bear. Last week when Joe was on, he was talking about having shot one. Oh, two bears came, and they were fighting, and that's what you saw. Like, this guy's not smart enough to know the difference between a wolf-headed creature that's jumping on his truck... Um, go back to the, 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 it ended up being two parts because they, they cut my feed. I don't know who, but somebody messed my feed up and it ended up, in, you know, in two parts. But go back and listen to last, last week's show. Um, and then I did a Saturday show where I told stories and I had Elijah Henderson come on and talk about the documentary, The American Werewolves. But if you go back to the last Tuesday live stream, we talk about it. And you can just go back and you can you can listen. And, and what they do, the same thing. Oh, these are bears. It's always these dogs or these bears. Like, people don't know the difference between what a giant werewolf... If somebody came and told me, it's like, are you 100% sure in 1990 that you saw a werewolf? Like, yes, I am, 100%. Did it resemble a bear? Hell no, it didn't. Did it look like a dog? No. Not unless you put three of them together and melded it with a man. It didn't look anything like a dog. And I don't, I don't even like the term dog man because very few of these things look dog-like. They look werewolf-like to me. So anyway, that's my soapbox and that's my take on it. Now, Joe, if you want to answer some questions or would you like to uh, talk about the uh, the cases that you that you were going to get into? What do you want to do? Is that me? Yeah, Martin. Yeah, he's talking to you, Martin. Yeah. I think yeah. I said Joe yeah. because Joe was on the yeah. show last week. I'm sorry, Martin. Go ahead. Yeah, that, that's okay. And, and believe me, I am in not only a, uh, just totally astonished in learning here, I am totally in 100% in agreement with everything that you said. And I, 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 I'm ready to talk to Joe, too, myself again. Uh, yeah, it, uh, well, it goes hand in hand with what you are saying that, these these creatures that do become flesh and blood, they have to be. Uh, even with my story, uh, you have an animal screaming after he has fired his uh, double-barreled, and I might add to a double-barreled Ithaca side-by-side, -side, I believe it was a number seven model 10-gauge shotgun. 
and I realize that's probably nothing to kill one of these creatures, I'm certain, but he did something because not only do I have a later report that they they did find something on the tree where we were at, but you have the motion and the, the screaming that took place when Harry did fire into these area where this something was standing. So these things do become flesh and blood at some point. They change from a spiritual to gaining flesh. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have something that is very intriguing that has taken place and is very common that I'm, 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 I'm wanting to point out. And that is this, that if you die within the land between the lakes, whether if you are a hunter or if you're on a trail and you're hiking, if you're fortunate enough that your family does get your body back, of the, the, the majority of the ones that I've been told about and what I've read and been privy to, they get everybody back in a in a box that is sealed and marked by government that it is not to be open and there's closed caskets. And that is a common thread shared with all these hunters or people that they are found um, in the park. Yeah. So, right. Lucky we that have found it all. Mr. Henderson and I shared a common thought many times together and that is this I believe he had at 16 at one point I was at 18 uh, different people whom have that we can speak of that have died in the park I don't use names because of being respectful to the families but we have 18 people that have been that are either missing or have been found uh, killed in some manner within the park uh, we'll, we'll state that from 1982 counting those four but 18 people 18 people we need answers for uh, including the last two that were missing in the park that went hiking and they found their vehicle that have not been found or seen since yeah yeah, and Barton, like you've been around the LBL for a long time, and and you absolutely have said that that you saw two different types of creatures when you were having problems when you when you, with your when you with your family's farm when you were living. That there were two creatures that were were distinctly different, and they were both working in tandem to terrorize your family, right? Martin, are you there? Yes, you're exactly you're exactly right, Wolf. And you're like a teacher up there. All the things you're saying, I know people are learning and getting answers. And uh, you're, you're extremely correct when you said you, you can't look at one piece of a puzzle and, and figure out the whole puzzle. You know, you have to look at all the pieces together to see what the picture really is. And it's so uh, amazing that I've come across Martin. He was the only one that I've ever interviewed that his story reminded me of my own back in 1975 so yeah it's just amazing and amazing knowledge and information that's being shared here tonight and martin i wanted to ask you one last question if, if you don't mind i know we've been on here a long time but i'd like to ask you how did this event affect your life in the years since that happened um i, I just briefly spoke said a little bit uh, my wife confessed to Joe and Jesse Doyle of Hell Ben Holler uh, something that uh, I would I would like to everybody to understand and know that we went for almost 20 years before I ever told my wife anything. I did not want to tell her, and I actually she would ask me questions as to what was wrong with me and things of that nature because of my nightmares where I would wake up. Uh, the nightmares have never stopped. I'm still fighting them in my dreams. Uh, it has given me a brand new perspective. I quit hunting. I no longer go into the deep woods. I will go into open fields, and when I'm fly fishing or fishing in my earlier earlier ages, you have to understand that I'm a man that used to pig hunt, bear hunt, I've been on many of these hunts, uh, 
uh, even even uh, with my old sheriff that I had back in the 1990s, we bear hunted together. So I went from a man that was totally, had no fear of the woods, had no call to be, had no fear of man, no fear of animal, to a man that I know now that I am not the apex predator in the woods any longer. And I'm smart enough to know and understand that I am not the apex predator any longer, even with a firearm. So it has affected me personally that it it, it did something to me uh, to where that I I know that there's bad things in the woods and, and it, it affected me psychologically. Yes, and uh, it affected my personal life because I no longer enjoy the, what I grew up as a child. Martin and I grew up in a, in a state where we either thought we were Davy Crockett, Jim Boy, or Daniel Boone, which all three will intersect in the state of Kentucky and the edge of Tennessee at some point. We grew up like that, sleeping in the woods. We grew up no fear, and now look at me or anyone else that's had this type of fear. Martin, though, has come up with a very unique answer, and I have placed a lot of my trust in, in God and in and, and Barton Nunley as well. I have a lot of trust in him and others, some Thank other you, folks. Martin. And, uh, but I've placed my trust in God, and as Barton, I'm going to quote him, and that if God intended for me to die at the hands of one of these things, then I would have already done so. I think we have a job left to do. Barton has a job left to do, and so do I. And if we have our way, there'll be some answers, and uh, hopefully we can prevent someone from being hurt or harmed. But, you know, whatever that we do, just open up the, to hunted 411 and the person who I, I totally respect, and that is David Politis, who, uh, uh, oh, gosh, I, this has got to be said before we move on and I, I lose it, but with David Politis, just take my little tiny story. I'm just one of hundreds, and you apply to the criteria of missing 411 hunted, and I was just about one tooth from becoming a meal to whatever is taking place in our national parks and the form of all these missing people that our government knows. But one thing before I, before another question or before I move on, I want, I want Josh and Barton to know something. Your convention not only was the best convention ever conference, but let me tell you something that was come up. You had 11 police officers there that were all LEOSA trained, all retired. And out of those 11 police officers that spoke, and we all huddled up and we talked, six of them have had cryptid encounters and were in fear of telling anyone because of their career loss and the ridicule and the fear. Six policemen out of 11, and if those others told, I believe... Out of the 11, they wouldn't have been there if they hadn't had something happen and they knew something. Six policemen have had encounters, and they told me those encounters at your conference. You you have absolutely accomplished so much, Josh Turner and the others, too. Yeah, I appreciate the kind words. That's, you know, I appreciate that. The, the only thing I would say um, about the missing 411 and with, with Politis' his work is that he leaves it kind of open-ended, which I wish he would push a little harder and say, hey, this is what I really think it is, instead of trying to leave things up to people. <clears throat> because some of, some of the cases are pretty, you could say, well, it's this, it's that, but there's a lot of them that are really weird, and you can't really explain it. And... If he would give more of a perspective on there, on his own, like his own take on it, you know, but he seems to be kind of guarded against that. That's the knock right there. I mean, and I'm not attacking the guy. I don't, I don't, I don't know him. I've never really dealt with him. Um, I did have a park ranger friend of mine that was trying to reach out to him and had said, hey, you know, I should catch all together, whatever. Nothing ever came of it. I didn't really respond to that, but. Um, 
I, I, I just wish, like I said, that more people would be willing to step up and come forward and say this, say what needs to be said. And, and I do get attacked a lot. People are like, oh, there's always drama. Yeah, because you're up here and you're telling people what they don't want to hear. They, I have two Amen. people that absolutely attack me relentlessly with their trolls because they don't like the, the, the narrative spinning away from them because they want they care about this narrative that's generating them income. Folks, I'm up here. I don't need the money. I don't need the money. I mean, you know, donations are great. It helps the show. It keeps us going. But at the end, I, I lost, you know, a few grand on that conference. But so what? Bringing everybody together and putting you know all those speakers under one roof that's never been done and, and, and that's something that i wanted to do and me with my help of ken gerhardt we accomplished that and i want to say you know that i really really would like to see people starting to shift and change and starting to be more open-minded and stop having this closed mindedness and when you compartmentalize everything of this picture i'm, I'm telling you exists you're doing us all a disservice. You're like, well, what do ghosts have to do with UFOs and Bigfoot and all these other things? It has everything to do with it. When I walk into a house and a blender goes, a ninja blender goes off, and they try to get me to go and look at the ectoplasm or whatever it was on the wall, pink, slimy, whatever, I didn't touch it. Um, and they're seeing shadow people, and then there's a werewolf creature, dogman, whatever you want to call this thing, at the window you know trying to get the child to come outside i mean you know why is all that in the same place and, you know i mean i know i'm amazing dumb okay as somebody called me on my show <laughs> so eloquently one night <laughs> but the, the bottom line is i'm not amazing dumb enough to think that that's not connected you're like oh you know what there's just a dog man it's a physical creature that just happened to stop by your house oh and this over here is a ghost that's what we call a poltergeist and so well is there a connection absolutely not now the dog man he just wants to be friends and he's asking your son to go outside and play that's why he's pushing the ball with his nose I didn't know there was a ball. There is. Also, the, the blender, uh, it's either an electrical problem or it's a type of ghost. But this ghost seems to be okay because he hasn't killed you yet. So I would put him on par with, like, Casper. I wouldn't say there's anything really bad going on here. Well, I'll see you later. I'll be back next week to take a video so we can go on the Travel Channel. You know, that just seems to be this kind of like this take, you know, and, and then Travel Channel is going to go, ooh, yeah, well, we're just going to take this part because it's ghosts, and then we're going to take this, and we're going to put it over here, and then, you know, and that's kind of been the order of things. I'm not I'm not saying the Travel Channel in particular because I like a few of those guys over there, like 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 Roger and, and Michael Sheehan, the guys that interviewed me for the Travel Channel, but in, any major network television sh sh channel, whatever. They're, they want a story that's going to fit with, with, with what they're doing. If, they're, if they have a series about UFOs, they're going to take that piece of the UFO story and they're going to put it in there. Just like people that write books, they'll take a Bigfoot story and pluck it out of a completely weird situation that's going on at someone's house or someone's property, and they will interview that person. And that person will tell them, dude, I've seen UFOs here. And they're like, yeah, okay, we don't care about that. But let me just get the Bigfoot part, and I'm going to go write about that. That's a problem. That is a problem because you're completely ignoring everything else. And th then the UFO people come along, and they're like, oh, so I saw big, you know, this Bigfoot. And they're like, yeah, mm, no, see, we're just worried about the UFO. Did you see gray aliens? No. Okay, well, yeah, we're just going to leave that Bigfoot part out. We're not going to talk about that. And, and the other weird ghost stuff that you had going on, That's that, yeah, we're not worried about that. But you can call this number here. It's a business card to some ghost people that can come and deal with that. Here's, an, here's you know, another researcher's name that you can call about the Bigfoot. Because nobody wants to be the one-stop shop because you're the crazy guy who's trying to change the way things are done. Because there is a connection. Okay, I can't stress that enough. And when you leave out all of that other information, all you end up with is like dogman stories. They have no, like, I mean, you, when you tell the story, you have to be able to tell the, the rest of it. Like Martin just did. There was Bigfoot and there were dogmen. It wasn't one or the other. Now, 
there are unscrupulous people in this business that'll let you come on and you can tell your story, absolutely tell your story. But they're gonna wanna hear about the dog man. They don't wanna hear, the, and if you wanna tell the Bigfoot part of it, go back on the other show and tell the Bigfoot part of it. Because that's how they operate. They don't wanna hear two different things are happening in the same area. It's like when you start telling them that, they're just like, ah, 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 ah. They, they just can't, you know. I've even seen their heads explode. I mean, I don't know if, if it happens regularly or not, but I've seen a few of them. They just laid down. I'm just joking. I'm kidding. They, they just can't take it. I mean, their mind is just like, they're like, eh, like, like, you know. I mean, once you start talking about an, a case that you go in and you study it, and, and these people have multiple things going on, people freak out, dude. They freak out. And they can't run away from you fast enough because that doesn't fit the narrative of the book they're writing or the show that they're on or whatever it is that they're doing. Now, if a person is gonna set out, sets out to write a book about Bigfoot, great, go ahead, write a book about Bigfoot. One of our friends, uh, Martin, uh, Lyle Blackburn, he just wrote a, a great, I'm sure, I haven't read it yet, but I'm sure it's great, Texas Bigfoot. Right, Yeah. can't wait to read it. Yeah, can't wait to read it. Ken does the same thing, they write books about Bigfoot. That's what you're doing, that's fine. But these people, they will, not Ken and Lyle in particular, but some people will go out and they will only investigate certain aspects of a phenomena and completely ignore everything else. And there has right. to be a connection because why on God's green earth is, is Skinwalker Ranch? Why are they seeing UFO activity? Why are they seeing portals opening up? Why are they seeing giant wolves and and reptilians? Like, I mean, dude, can, can, can you not see the, the problem with that? Why we're so blind? That's a problem. And that's why when Martin coming on the show tonight and being so upfront and talking about this and, and letting people know, it, it's, you can't, I mean, you can't, I don't know how you can, you can't downplay it. I mean, there's no you can't overstate this. This is this is amazing, you know. And I, it's a I part like of the, the puzzle. It is. It is. And talking to Joe last week and talking to you, I've had another guy that was on my show that was a survivor of the attacks. And one thing everybody has in common, though, that comes up here and says anything, people are always going to be poo pooing it and saying, "Well, that's not correct. That's not it. That's your opinion." But having witnessed a dog man when I was fifteen. And then lived in a house where there was a ton of activity. Um, those two aren't connected, two different things. I get that. But, dude, we saw some freaky stuff in that place. Freaky stuff, dude. Um, shadow entities having dreams about gargoyles, and we were all dreaming the same thing. I mean, that's not a coincidence. Those, those are not coincidences, dude. People, people, somebody told me today a story of this gargoyle type creature that was hovering over them while they were having sleep paralysis nick redfern's article not to 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 kill the kill you know the the suspense word about his article you want to go read the article but he talks about encountering a dogman type creature while he was under sleep paralysis nick redfern it was his own encounter and he talks about it in that article about the conference if you go to the prt uh, web page uh, prt uh, group or go to my uh, whatever Facebook, you can read that. It's a mysterious universe. Or go to mysterious universe and read it. Doesn't matter. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And so these people, they say, well, I had sleep paralysis. I've had people tell me that they've seen alien greys under sleep paralysis, elf looking creatures. I've seen people tell me that they saw these goblin, gremlin looking things that just don't, they don't look like anything else. I've seen, I've heard people doing transcendental meditation and leaving their bodies or they're having a, a, a sleep paralysis and they see these gargoyle type creatures, these bird like entities. I've seen people describe werewolves and, and Sasquatch type creatures. You know, and I don't think it's a coincidence. And I think we're all making a huge mistake when we don't all come together and say this is all part of a greater whole. That is my take on it. And I really believe that there's a connection to all this. And and Barton and me, you, you share, I don't want to speak for you. What, are you. what is your take, Barton? You speak for yourself. Well, I've been saying the exact same thing you just said since 1985, so 40 years, yeah. And I've been online since 2005, and uh, you know that's 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 what I I talk about, and I know that they're connected because I've lived in haunted houses, 
when uh, the Bigfoots were roaming around outside in the field and UFOs were buzzing around the skies and Black Panthers were running around. You know, there's not there's not a very good chance of encountering all those different phenomenons in one house, you know, unless they're connected. And I've lived in three where all that's taking place at the same time. So the connection has been revealed to me for decades now. And I'm just so glad that people are finally coming to realize what's going on. And if you turn away from the narrative that everyone wants you to believe and just starting to connect the dots themselves, you know, all these different phenomena, they are, they are related. One One thing definitely has to do with the next. So, you know, that's that's my stance. It's the same as yours, and it's I think it's the correct one, or I wouldn't be uh, writing in books and, and telling people that, you know. I just tell the truth as, as I, know, I know it, and I've come to experience it and learn it, and that's what I do. So, yeah, you're right, Wolf. I think you're exactly right on that. Yeah, and Martin, do, do, do you have more to say? Uh, I can add. I can add a few things as long as I'm not uh, going too far on my on y'all on everyone's time. Um, I, I, everything that you said, Josh and Barton, this is a huge, just small, tiny piece of this puzzle of a huge, great big picture. When you put the puzzle together, it all joins together. It doesn't matter if it's the hauntings or if it's the werewolf outside or a dog man looking in side while the plasma is hanging off the wall and down the street there's a black panther with the UFO in the ceiling of the, of the skyline it all interfaces it all comes together into pieces of the puzzle and the greatest mistake that we can make right now because you guys, you folks have put together something that is, can change this entire think and pattern. We can bring it all. You guys can bring all this together as and and put these pieces, this knowledge, this this intelligence, this intel, and change this group think of it's all all it's not connected. It has to come together, and it all is just a tiny piece of the puzzle. And I truly believe in this, and I saw that at the convent, at the conference, and, and 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 believe me, to have eleven police officers come together with the group of people, and six of them had some type of an encounter with four of them out of that group was in the LBL, and they all were too scared to talk about it. If we can put all these people together, add all this to knowledge in this. This piece is a puzzle. How much more knowledge will we gain? And we're that much closer. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Perfect sense. Makes yeah. perfect sense. And and Martin, we talked about this, you know, uh, briefly at, at the conference, and, and we, you, we we got to visit very briefly. But um, you know, you when you were up there talking, you captivated the audience, and you looked at everybody, and you looked me right in my eyes, and, and you there was no lie there. I mean, you told what you told, and Barton, you know, you, me and you met face-to-face, -face and we talked, and it was, I know you guys are, are honest people who are telling, the, the, you're giving your truths, you know, and that's why I asked Barton to come on and do some co-hosting with me because we have a very similar view, and I believe we at PRT, we're we're going to be the spearhead, you know, we're going to be yes. the, the 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 hammer that's gonna that's gonna drive this movement. And and the old guard, like I said, you lead follower, get out of the way. If you, if you're not down to hear the truth then the old guards of these different compartmentalized groups, well, you know, I don't know what to tell you. You're going to get left behind because I, I've explained this to people too. My listening audience, I believe, and this is not just because they support me, but they are the most intelligent of, of all. I've been in tons of other shows. And that's not a knock. I'm not knocking anybody else's audiences. But my my audience, they have a, they're, they're used to a certain level of... Uh, like of, of quality they're used to a certain level of intelligent conversation and you know they're that's just how they are i mean they're smart and they're they're well read typically well rounded they tend to be more intellectual you know um but they're open-minded and they want to learn and that's that's one thing that i think a lot of these uh, shows are missing you know it's like 
you just got to get that audience that, that's that's going to push, you know. And so what I did with that conference was pick as many of the best people that I could that I knew that I could trust, that I've spent hours on the phone with. I've spent hours talking to all these people, and you know, spent hours dealing with all these different podcasters like Josh Nokio and Tony Merkel and Bettina Moss. Those are the people that are are with us at the forefront of all this. You know, uh, Ken, Lyle, and Nick, of course, have been friends of mine for a long time. David Weatherly. I mean, you had all these people, Nick Valenti. They, I mean, they they are the, the ones that are going to drive this forward, that are, we're, we're going to propel this. And I think that, that PRT has taken a leading role in all of this. Um, I used to, you know, I always said I'm willing to follow somebody. And I'd follow them through hell as long as they're a good leader. But when when I feel like it's time for me to step up and do the leading, I'm going to do that because you're not getting what you need to get out of your leadership. And I think what it takes is just a, a really strong group of people, like all of us together, to to propel this you know movement. And, and so we can try to find more connections and connect the dots and come to rational conclusions a lot of people say well you're, this is all a bunch of hokey pokey i've heard people tell me that this you know it, you're, you're talking about all this you know whatever magic and i said magic is just a science that hasn't become science yet that's all it is um, they, you know these people they use symbols and all this other things what do you think that means this is geometry dude when mm -hmm. people take DMT or these other you know substances, I've never taken it, but I know people who have, and they see all kinds of geometric patterns and symbols. What do you think that is? What do you think that is? Why do you think that all this stuff is the way it is? Why do you think that when people do some of these uh, travels and things, they have to use certain symbols to protect themselves and stuff? And see, and that's that's because they don't have God. Because if you do, you don't have to worry about all that. But it exists for a reason. It's there for a reason. You know, there are rules and laws and everything. And we are so far down, you know, that we can't comprehend it. But we as a community have to come together and we have to look and say, hey, we got to raise the, sh you know, let's raise the bar. And then let's jump over it. And let's raise it again. Let's just keep on until we can get more truth out of this. And, and if something happens, we're together, we can prepare for what's coming. Because you look at what's happening in this world, it's not good. <laughs> There's a lot of bad things going on. And I'm, I'm sad because people are just not prepared. And if, if you can't even get a person who believes in the UFO phenomena to believe in Bigfoot and vice versa, that's a problem. Because they're literally playing in the same field, they just don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to accept it. They they have a veil in front of their eyes. Veil. They're just like blinders we would put on a mule. They have a veil. They have blinders. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And if you can't believe a former paternal head of the paternal order of police and a thirty-two year veteran of the police force there in Tennessee, I mean, if you can't believe him, then who the hell are you going to believe? I mean, what does it take to make you understand that these things are not, you know, that they're real and they're not what everyone is claiming that they are, and they're not friendly, and they're killing people, and, you know, I don't know what else you can do other than kill one and, you know, drag its head in front of everyone and say, here, there's your proof. Short of that, if you can't believe someone like Martin and Joe and many of the other ones that are they're speaking out here, well, not many, but several. And if you can't believe that, then you'll never, you're never going to believe the truth. You know, if you if you say that science can't prove any of this, so I'm not going to believe it. Well, your your stance is that science is a rock, and it's already complete. And you're standing on that rock and saying everything that's not of this rock is not real and not true because science here that I'm standing on can't prove it. But science isn't a rock. And like I said the other night, well, if it's like a snowball rolling downhill and it gets bigger and goes faster with every ounce of data and facts and knowledge that it accumulates, right? So in the end, science it doesn't know everything yet. So you can't say with well, science, you can't prove the scientific, so it isn't real. Then you're, a, you're not really following science per se. You're, you're more following scientism, which is simply another form of religion. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, because the people people who I see signs of people's yards. I believe in science. Science is a very incomplete thing to believe in. I can tell you right now, there are I know several scientists, and one of my good friends that I grew up with, his dad's a scientist, and he'll be the first to tell you that science is very incomplete. We only have so much. You know, and what's really sad is that these people will say, do you have any, they, they, they get this smarmy, you know, do you have any proof that these things have killed people? Let me tell you something. Even if I had the proof and I showed you right there one killing them, you'd be like, oh, that's CGI. I mean, they're, they're never, that's just a cop out so they can com, com, continue to follow the narrative of whoever they want to follow. You know, so they can they can go and listen to somebody that has a certain agenda and a narrative, and they can feel okay with it and be like, okay, you know, that's that's the point right there. Yeah, they don't have to step outside their comfort zone to contemplate anything. They can just sit right there and live their lives, you know, just like they're going and never really learn anything. And for, in my own experience, just like Martin's, I learned this from things that have happened in my life, I, and not from books that I've read or. TV shows that I've watched or anything like that. These things have happened to me, so I know they're fact, and they're not they're not a fantasy. They're you know they're not made up. I don't have any agenda other than to tell people the truth of what happened to me and my family. You know back then, and so I'm not trying to sell books or be on TV or be on anybody's YouTube podcast or whatever. I'm just trying to tell the truth, and that's what Martin's doing. And, Martin, thanks so much for being so brave. I've shook your hand. I've looked into your eyes. I know you're an honorable man. And if people can't believe you, then they're they're really in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank, you, you, thank you for being on the show, Martin. I know you were a little bit nervous going in, but I thank you both for being here. You did a great job, Martin, telling your story. And um, – I'm going to let you guys go, but I appreciate you guys coming on. And um, thank you for being a part of PRT. And, of course, Barton and Martin will talk again. Thank you. Sure. Thank you Looking very, forward. very much, Josh. If I can end with just one slight little little thing, statement. I stood in front of that podium down there in front of the good folks of Paris, Tennessee, and I looked up, and I didn't want to say the wrong words or anything, but I wanted to say to those people as I go off tonight, I knew I was standing in front of the, some of the smartest people because – they came there for answers. They would not have been there. They were some of the greatest, most intelligent minds that you put together, whether if it was on the stage with your folks you brought, but your members that have come to see you and to hear you, Josh Turner, and I knew we were standing with a great group of individuals, and they sought answers, and they're seeking. That's why they're with you, Josh. Sir. Thank you. Thank exactly you for those right. kind words, Martin, and I was honored. I mean, when you brought him up there and he started talking, I was like, oh, this guy's not on the on the, on the the deal, you know? But I was, like, captivated from beginning to end. I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, this dude is... Well, I, I kind of surprised you by bringing Martin up there, didn't I? I mm -hmm. didn't even tell you about that. Did you I didn't won't? even tell me, but, I mean, I was like, I, I made the statement, though. Well, whoever like, wanted well, to speak... Who's this? who's this guy? Yeah, who's whoever this wanted guy to speak, I said, let him come speak. We don't care. Dog man <laughs> right. whisper. He, he was, we told him, go ahead, show up. Present your evidence of an evolutionary creature that runs around. That, uh, who cares? You know? <laughs> But uh, all right, guys. Well, I appreciate you guys coming on. I appreciate it, uh, Martin, very much, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, Josh Turner. God bless you, and God bless Miss Nellie Turner as well. Thank you. And Martin, you got a friend for life in me. Thank you, my brother. I feel the same as well here, friend well. and brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Martin. You're welcome. My pleasure, Martin. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Okay, I'll see you guys. Good night, guys. everyone. God bless. Good night, good night paratroopers. Y'all have a good night. Be safe. Bye. So, that, that was Martin Groves telling his incredible encounter. You know, if you guys have any comments, you, wanna, you want me to talk or whatever... Let me give you a little bit more time here. Um, we had 800 people in the chat tonight. That's just that's going to keep happening because you guys know where to find this stuff. Next week, David Spinks is going to come on and talk about Dogman. And, and it's either Virginia or West Virginia. I'm sorry I don't have the notes in front of me, but Spinks has written, written a book about it. 
And then um, after that, it's Carter Bouchard, who was part of the BFRO for a long time. He's got a lot of crazy Bigfoot stories and, 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 and some and some couple of crazy dogman stories are pretty pretty intense stuff that we're going to talk about and then the week after that it's uh, my friend shoddy boy uh that's his handle or whatever but he uh it's dave hinda and uh he's gonna come on and he's gonna talk tell his encounter prt train is rolling guys I mean, you get on the train and we go, or you get off and you just go and wander around in these compartmentalized little fun houses. This is the new era, okay? This is the new era. This is the new way. We're going to get to the truth of these things, and, and those that don't want to hear it, they're going to get left behind. I'm sorry. You know? I'm not up here trying to be the the dictatorial boss or whatever. I, I, I don't. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is one thing, okay? The answers. Now you might not you might not be happy with my conclusions at this point because I'm not done yet, folks. We're not done, but I'm going to keep bringing it to you, and you you be the judge every week, week in, week out, and then we're going to do this these twelve episodes. We're going to drop them, boom. We're about to record with Michigan Rob. We're going to record with Josh Nokio. Josh Nokio is going to tell you some crazy stuff about possession. I'm going to tell you, the train is going to keep rolling. And some are going to jump for joy and others are going to gnash their teeth because the fact is the fact that we're going to be here week in and week out. People don't like it. People are mad. The haters are coming out. Some of these people, I can just tell you flat out, they're the enemies of God. I'm telling you right now, they do not like God. They don't like me. You know? Oh, well, sorry, I'm not a communist, and sorry, I believe in God. Sorry, I don't want to be a part of your dark age that you're trying to usher in. I'm trying to usher in an era of reason, of light, truth. These people aren't. They're not interested in that. They're interested in this. Money. I don't need your money. I don't need your money, dude. I don't I don't sit up here to make a bunch of money. I, I lose money doing this. I'm up here and we're losing money, bro. For real. Anthony and Tony taking a weekend off from, from doing their jobs. They, they cost them about a grand each to go up there. Cost me a bunch of money. And you had me. You had me on the ropes. I was this close. And you know what? I didn't even feel like I was quitting for that. I just was going to like, I'm going to go right. I'm going to enjoy myself. I'm going to focus on some hobbies maybe. I'm going to go and just keep focusing on my work, building my businesses and doing what I'm doing. And I would have been gone and out of your lives. Yeah, I'd say hi every now and then, maybe show up on a show or whatever, and then write some books, whatever. But you kicked me when I was down. Big mistake. Your hate keeps me warm. A friend of mine sent me something. I'm going to read it to you real quick. I want to show you something. This comes from my friend Ann Celine. And she sent me this. She says, you can try to dirty my name and I'll wear your hate like war paint. She says, this reminded me of you. He's a dear friend of mine and Nellie's. That's right. Go ahead. Sully my name. Because I'm just going to wear it. I don't care about your hate. All you did was show me that I needed to stay in the fight. I ended up getting advice from Ken and from... from, from uh, Barton, from my brother, and, and several other, but it's, it's more people that I can even name that were just like, don't, don't do this. And I was like, yeah, I, but I'm, I want to, I just want to go and do some other stuff. And they were like, look, this is what you need to do. This is what you, you know, you have an insight and you need to, you need to teach people. I don't have to go out and find my students. My students come to me. My friend, Darl, she told me that. Darl is, is the mother of a good friend of mine. And she said, your students will come to you. If you really want to come and, 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 and learn, 
than come every Tuesday. And you can learn. Drink from the, the, the stream of knowledge we have going on here. Because there are so many people out there that are fake. They're profiteers. And anybody that tries to say people that I had at the conference were, though I pick them, hand pick them for those reasons that they are not fake and just trying to make profit. They're trying to do what they do, which is their passion. The writers, they've had their own experiences. They want to get to the bottom of things, dude. Podcasters and authors, people that you can trust, that I would I would trust, you know, like drive my truck, drive my car, watch my house, you know what I mean? There wasn't anybody at that conference that I wouldn't trust 100%. And all they had to do, all these people had to do was leave me the hell alone and I, I would have faded off into the sunset because I was 100% committed to just take either taking a long hiatus and if I was happy with it, I wasn't going to come back. But no, you just had to keep swinging. You had to keep trying to kick me when I was down. And now I'm very much here. I like this chair. Like I said before, I think me and this chair are going to have a long relationship. I think we're going to be going steady. Because you people, not you, my listeners, but these people who want to run us out of here, we're making waves. They don't like it. Oh, so mad. Some of these people are so twisted. I get emails. They, they say, I like your show, but I hate you. Well, thanks for the views. Because in my real life, in my day-to-day -day life, and this is not, I'm going to say this is my real life, but in the people that I meet and deal with in my day-to-day -day life, my everyday life, nobody's telling me they hate me. I have a ton of friends. Everybody knows me. And I know a lot of people. And there's a thousand people I can call on in my day-to-day -day life and say, hey, can you help me out here? Or, and, or, or they know that they can call me at all hours of the day and night and say, hey, can you help me out? And they know that I will. Blue Crew says, I still wonder the Dogman Sasquatch eye shine indicates an alien biotechnology power energy source that requires recharging on a regular basis in order to maintain their supernatural abilities. That I don't have the answers to. That your guess is as good as mine. But you know what? If we keep working together, we might be able to come to some really, really cool conclusions. Diane Rain says, fight the good fight by Tramp. Read the lyrics. They resonate. I also love Shooting Star's song, Last Chance We Are... Our own heroes, God made us this way. Namiria, hi. I'm going to say hi to you. Pink Dahlia, it was good seeing you guys at the conference, all you guys. Bernard Fox says, losing money, gaining truth. Yeah. It's just part of, part of it. Forest Groves, good seeing you. Can you see at the conference? Carl King, he says, I love you no matter what you're doing. Keep on fighting, brother. You're a warrior, mind, body, and spirit. Thank you for that. Susan, Susan Woodcarver says, we would have supported you, whatever your decision was. That's what family does. But I'm glad you're still here. Hi, Artistic Bunny. I haven't forgot about you. We're going to drop this show on the Paranormal Roundtable group. Go join. It's free to join. Just go to Facebook and join. And we're going to give away uh, Martin Grove's book. Martin Grove is going to send me 20 copies of it, and we're going to give it away. I'm also going to be getting a shipment of international cryptids from Kenny Irish, another good guy that was at the conference. He sold out. His books sold out. Um, go do me a favor, folks, my paratroopers. Please do me a favor. Help out my friend Kenny Irish and go to Amazon and, and leave a review for his book. Get his book, read it, leave a review. So, you know, it's a good book. Check it out. I wrote the foreword.
So, I mean, you know, all these people who've come at me in different ways. My friend DW told me, he's like, it's going to be a never-ending supply of people that are just going to, the darkness, as he told me, he said, the darkness is coming for you. And he says that there, it's going to, after this one, it's going to be another and another, and it's going to, they're going to keep coming. Because they're influenced by the darkness. And they're going to keep showing up. You'll defeat one enemy, another one will show up. Like an assembly line. And, and so far, he's been, he's been proven to be right about that. But what you got to do is stay strong. You can't just keep letting them hit you, and then, you know, you think, oh, I'm just going to, you know, oh, I'm taking a gut punch, whatever. Boxing's like that. You get hit, and it hurts. <laughs> but you can't lay down. Because everything in your body is telling you to lay down and give up and just go on with your life. And it would be so much easier if you would just accept defeat and go on and live, whatever. And if to me it wasn't accepting defeat, it was just getting finding some peace. But these people, they just want to keep pushing. So I'm like, okay, fine. You made my decision for me. They're so easily influenced by the by the darkness. Have I heard stories of Bigfoot and Dogman together? Yes, I have. On multiple occasions. Fighting one another, but also working together. I mean, you know, or they're in the same area. You know, you got these crawlers. You got Dogman, Bigfoot, Goatman. They're all in the same area. And then there's these, all these places that are considered to be haunted. And these things show up in those places. There's reasons for that. Phil Stearns in the chat. Phil, I've told your story before on DER. And it's a great story. And I would just, folks, let's petition Phil to come on the show and tell his story. Everybody start typing right now. Phil, tell your story. Tell your story. He's, he says, I have a German accent. It's great. Your accent isn't even, you, you can just, you can speak perfectly good English. You can do it. It says, Diane Rain, thank you for that donation. It says, truth will always resonate. We can see and feel your honesty, integrity, intelligence. You resonate. Thank you. I think all my listeners do. Shotzi, thank you for that donation. That's that's incredible. That's a really cool one, too. You're amazing. I like the little samurai dog. That's really cool. Yeah, Chaniti or Kaniti, and I say it, but it says, I'm sorry they did that to you, but I'm happy that they did, so you didn't go anywhere. Yeah, it is kind of funny how that is. Yeah, they, they come at me. But what they don't understand is when I tell you that I'm a fighter, I really mean that. I'm telling you that, the truth, that's the truth, that's what I've done. If you saw my shins, you would know what I'm talking about. There's always somebody who's got to say something stupid. You can look at some of my old pictures and you can see my hands. Those aren't from just punch. I, I never punched my hand, bags with, with not, without wrapping my hands. So when you saw my knuckles busted up, there was a reason for it. I was a fighter. Not bragging. Telling you the truth. I never give up. And my brother was like, what are you talking about? What are you, what are you quitting? I was like, well, I'm just, I need the peace. He goes, dude, you have a job. You have a duty to go on there every Tuesday and talk to these people and drop shows on Friday if you feel like dropping the shows, but you have to be there on Tuesday. He's like, my younger brother's not a quitter. Show us the cauliflower ears, bro. Man, Conquistador, I haven't wrestled or grappled in years. It's been all stand-up, you know. But I, you don't lose. It's like riding a bike. I mean, I haven't done... Well, I take that back. I did do some... I did a little bit of wrestling uh, about three years ago. But I haven't been training on a regular basis. So, yeah. I, have, I don't have that. I've always been more of a stand-up fighter because wrestling and grappling just came naturally. But somebody with athletic ability can truly beat 
a guy who trains all the time. I see these fighters and they're like, I'm a fighter, I train all the time. Are you winning? Because if not, you're just a guy who trains all the time and gets beat up. Because I've fought lots of guys who train all the time and I beat the crap out of them. I've literally gotten off of a bar stool and beat the crap out of them. I'm a third degree black belt BJJ. So we're going to roll around the ground right here at the bar. Get off the bar stool and knock them out. That was a great fight. Whatever. See, come on, Phil. Everybody, come on, guys. We're going to have to spam Phil. Just keep... Phil has to come on and tell his story, folks. It is a, a good story. It was one of the ones that stood out to me. And there's a few others out there, too, that I, I got to meet at the conference. They were like, you told my story on DER, number 169, blah, blah, blah. It was people like telling me that they, they had told me the story, whatever the numbers were. And there were so many people I couldn't even keep track. And I was like amazed. Thanking me, telling me I was overwhelmed. Ken was right. Ken, Ken told me right before the, the doors opened, he goes, are you ready to be mobbed by your fans? And I was like, okay. You know. I didn't even see hardly anybody out there, and then the door opened, and everybody just poured in. I was like, wow. It was awesome. Yeah, see, let's go, Phil. We're not gonna get away with it, Phil. You're gonna get we're gonna get that story from you. Yep, Susan, you're right. Doesn't go away. Yeah. King Dahlia says, we mobbed you getting out of your car. Yes, I wasn't mobbed, but I had a few people coming up to me and we're like, you know. Yeah, Mike Turner, because fights start on the, they start standing up. You don't start a fight on the ground. It's cute to think you know, that that's how they train. It's like, oh yeah, okay. Um, but that's not how fights start. And if you can't take a punch, well, you probably shouldn't be fighting. And I've seen some guys in BJJ do that. I'm not knocking on BJJ because I've trained with that too. What I'm saying is, well, it's more Japanese. But, but I mean, still, same principle. I still haven't seen Cabin in the Woods. I'm planning on checking it out. Tony, you have me on a messenger, I think. Just remind me. Send me a message on messenger. And I'll get to it. Don't forget, me and Barton are working on an ambitious project where we're going to do about 10 to 12 episodes, somewhere in there, and then we're going to drop them all at once onto our channel, and you guys are just going to have a buffet of shows to listen to. Clever Gandizador says, what's the deal with the girl in the leprechaun in the closet? She's like a grown-up now. I ran into her one day downtown, and yeah... She's, a, she's an adult, but she remembers it, you know. Um, didn't get around to asking her, hey, come on the live stream, but I thought about it, and I said, hey, you know, if you ever want to record, we can get together and talk. I don't know how interested she is in doing that. I think she's a waitress now, but uh, D, D, you might be able to get a hold of her mom. D used to date her mom. <laughs> I don't know. You know, D, D went out with her for a little bit. Yeah, I'm expecting memes in the group, Curtis. If you guys would go to the PRT, Wolf Turner PRT uh, fan page, made by Phil Stern, um, those guys are admins on there, and th they make a lot of funny stuff. So, Josh Turner, I would love your thoughts on old Steven Seagal. He's a fraud. I would tell you right now, I would not be afraid to get into a fight with Steven Seagal, uh, even if I was a, a leprechaun. I think he's full of crap. I hope somebody goes and tells him I said that. Dominic Espinosa, Army of Darkness, is still the best comedy horror hands down. Yes, it is. Uh, you guys also send me some messages if you want. If you want to, let us know what you're looking for. 
what you would like um, to hear more about, not just Dogman, but if you want to hear more Bigfoot or you want to hear about the rake or whatever, just give us a call, man. Uh, give us a, a, a message. Post it in the group, in PRG group. Let us know what you want. We're here. We want to hear what you have to say. Corley Cantor says, I wish someone would go back and listen to all your shows and come up with a long description of each one so we could have a library and make it easier to go back to find a, a particular show. Yeah, man, it, the live streams, especially because they're like three or four hours of pop. The shortest ones are probably two hours, and there's, those are rare. It's usually three hours on average. And then you have all those like 170-something of the podcast episodes done a lot of work more giant spider stories demons Wendigo I've done a whole thing on Wendigo do gargoyles have babies okay somebody was asking about that in, in, in the chat now if you look at this I'm going to say I'm going to talk about this real quick I have done work on gargoyle type creatures. Until I did sh a show on it, nobody was telling me I saw a gargoyle. They were telling me what they saw, and I put a description on there. Well, this sounds like a gargoyle, or this sounds like a vampire, or this sounds like a Bigfoot, or a dogman, um, goat man, whatever. People usually just tell me I saw something, I had an encounter with something weird, and because I'm not just one niche person that has this one niche, I'm versatile, I can move back and forth. That's, that's the whole point of the show, is for us to be versatile. Not just me, but my team and my y'all as a group. Y'all know how it is. We 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 delve into all kinds of subjects because I think they're all related. And um, so, you know, if a gargoyle comes into this earth, into our plane of existence, and it takes on a flesh and blood form, and there's more, there's a male, female. Why not? Why wouldn't it? People say, oh, it's proof that they're all physical because they breed. Not necessarily. Demons can breed. Um, another thing, too, I was going to say about the Dogman connection with the Anunnaki. I think that they, the reason that they're found in places where the dead, you know, are buried. and different, there's, there's, there's a theory behind that. that think about it. If you were created... And your masters created you, genetically engineered you to be the protectors of their stargates. That is a connection between physical and spirit. So, of course, they're going to be in places where the dead dwell. Zolotl from the Aztec tradition, Anubis from the Egyptian tradition. I mean, there's a whole bunch of uh, stories about these creatures, and they are the guardians, so to speak, uh, between the flesh and blood and the, and, and the uh, spiritual. Doesn't mean they're good guys. They're guarding those carns or whatever you want to call them, places of power. Um, because th that's what their job was. To keep people from going back and forth. Roulette says live call-in shows. I don't know how that would work. A live call-in show could be really sketchy because people could call and go, F you, blah, 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 and then hang up, you know, and I'm like, I don't know about that. Joanne Harden has a very qu good question. Josh, have you ever heard any history of where the goggles came from? I actually did a show with D.A. Roberts and Nick Valenti. So you can go back and look. If you find, go to Deuce X Machina, which is D.A. Roberts' show. And you can get, yeah. The face in the crowd, yeah, I agree with you. Somebody said ghost stories. How many people here like the ghost stories? Also, if you go back to my show on Saturday, 
and you check it out. I mean, we were talking about some different things, and, and we got into some different, uh, it was just an impromptu show. Would you guys like to see that more? Maybe be surprising you on the weekend with the show? I mean, if you guys are into that, I mean, I could do that more often. Coolly, yeah, there are there are, there are thoughts by people that that say, yeah, they're the guardians, the gargoyles are protectors, but I, I get just as many stories of them. Not, I don't really get any stories of protecting people. But these things that look like gargoyles, I don't know if they is what they are, but they're not really protecting people. They're terrorizing people. You know, I had one today. Uh, She's, she's going to come on the show. She said she would. She, she's one of the owners of Black Sheep Boxing, where we used to train. I say used to because I haven't been training because I hurt my elbow. And, and you know and then having COVID or whatever, I had to slow it down because I ended up with AFib. And, but I'm on my road back. I'll be going to a UFO conference this weekend to hear Daniel Jones speak. Daniel Jones has been on my show. He helped us with the conference. He was invaluable. So I'll be heading up there. Yes, Slapo, send in your little people stories. John Sablon says gargoyles are not good. Not from what I've seen, the, the ones, at least these things that look like gargoyles. I know the legends are supposedly that they are protectors and they do all this and that, you know, but from what I've seen, what I've been able to, to, to doesn't seem like, you know, So Phil says to call him on the show now. Well, I can't right now. I gotta go eat dinner. Phil, I'd love to. I wish I could, but I, I don't. I, I have to go. Um. Anyways, folks, it's been real. I bet it's been great. I mean, you know, I hate to leave the chat with seven hundred people in there, but Jay, Jay says, can you do a show on the Anunnaki? I did one on Bible theology, but, you know, it seems like it didn't get a lot of views because I guess the term Bible theology didn't sound paranormal enough or whatever, but we talked, we delved into a lot of really unusual subjects. Like, it was a very uh, informative show. Just like the show I did with Laura Ketchledge, uh, episode 38, 39, something like that, where I talk about the city of night. And people are always asking me about that, but they haven't gone back and listened to the episode. So we, we, we touched on that, but I never really revisited because people have, you know, I just, well, no, people just go and listen to that, you know? We may just have to, like, if we can't get you on the live, we may just have to record it, Phil, and then Dominic Dominic says, seriously, Josh, thank you for being the best paranormal show ever. Much love to you and your family. Screw the haters. They're everywhere. Just stay strong. Keep it up, brother. Savage Grammy says, sure, love the ghost stories, too. Corley says, got a UFO witness who recorded UFO and received th strange, threatening messages from someone who claiming to be Anunnaki. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. John Sablon says, I have a story about the city of night. It's in our dreams. Yeah. Hit me up because me and Barton are going to be doing, if you, if anybody in the audience is listening right now, me and Barton are looking into who we're going to record with and people giving their firsthand accounts. And uh, we're going to do a lot of work and we're going to, you know, interview people and go back and forth and, and, and talk about this stuff. Because me and Barton have very similar views. 
I hope everybody's excited is, is, is as excited as we are about it. And Scorpion, he says, when I dream, I end up in the city of night. I know. But if you got that, uh, Jean Sablon, let me know. We we love to to interview you about it. Artistic Bunny, we need to get together and do some work. All right, guys. I really got to go eat dinner. Just reading all the awesome comments. Demos Mars says, I had one encounter with a disembodied white hairy arm, and I'm curious if anyone else has something similar. I've talked about that on the show, actually. Just disembodied, like arms or legs, you know, just an arm that choked this lady in a basement. It was just crazy. I love everybody. Um, please support the people that I work with. We, uh, Josh Ninocchio is and me are, are, and Barton are kind of leading the charge on this, assembling a, an all-star team to work together. Um, we're, we're allies. We're friends and we're family, and I want you guys to all take that journey with me. Support Ken Gerhardt, Nick Redfern, David Weatherly, Barton Nunley, Lyle Blackburn, um, Kenny Irish. You know, these are some of my favorite authors. They do really good work. Pray for Linda Godfrey. Um, me and Barton talked about her on Sunday. He had a conversation with her. I. It's just very hard. It's a very hard situation. We care about her very much. Um, God does do miracles. And he can turn anything around. Her health isn't good. I'm not at liberty to talk about it right now. Um, but, um, yeah, Josh Ninocchio, support his channel. He, he released... The first of the series of Mysterious Kentucky, reading from Barton's book. And he got 25,000 views in like the first two hours. So I can only imagine how many he got. So you guys go and support Josh over at What Lurks Beneath, Tony Merkel, Bettina Moss. Uh, these are my allies. These are my friends. Vault, let me not forget Vault and Nightmare Nation. You got Truth and Bass and, and Sean. Those guys do great work. I mean, uh, Space Tat Radio with Dave Scott. Now, I was supposed to be on there this coming Saturday, and they had already advertised it, but I'm going to be with Ken Gerhard in San Antonio uh, supporting uh, our, our good friend Daniel, who we, we owe him that much. He's a good guy. So, um, yeah, we're going to be up there in San Antonio at the, at the, at the UFO conference. Um Don't want to leave anybody out, but if I if I did, I, I, I'm I'm sorry, but there are so many people to to name. D A R P uh, the the North American Dogman Project in in, in the N A D P with Jody and uh, Nick Valenti. Um, who else? If I left anybody out, I'm sorry. But, you know, these are my allies. These are the people that I brought together. D.A. Roberts and Ron Murphy. Can't forget them. Especially Ron being as smart as he is and being on there. And then D.A. doing his podcasts and, and writing those fiction books. His books are a different type of fiction, folks. You have to go and check out D.A. and his books. And don't forget about Ron. Ron's probably the smartest one of us all out there. But DA has, like, when it comes to those fiction cryptid books, dude, do yourself a favor. Go buy a book from him. Ron is a scholar. I just, I can't tell you. It's just, it's unreal. Also, my friend Ann Celine has a book out, like I had mentioned before with, with her on the show, Aperture in the Veil. Go check out Aperture in the Veil. She had a pretty crazy Bigfoot encounter. Yeah, that I told, or that she told on my show, on the uh, podcast.
And even Trey Felton's written a book and is a Bigfoot hunter. The guy that catered the place, the, the, the event, he's a Bigfoot hunter. That's crazy. He goes out looking for them and he calls it rogue tripping. And he has a plane that he even uses to fly. Actually, I'm not going to be eating hamburgers tonight. My mom, my, my mom, my, uh, my, my wife, um, I said my mom, I'm so used to, my mother used to cook dinner all the time. She'd always invite me to go eat dinner, but she's gone. But, uh, my wife, my, my sweet Nellie, she's making us uh, prime rib that Trey Felton gave us. So good to have friends. Because in my day-to-day -day life, people are like, oh, he's always having... I don't have beef with people in my day-to-day -day life. Most people don't want beef with me in my day-to-day -day life. They talk crap on there because on, on the internet because they can get away with it. It's a lot of different spectacle when you're in my face. So anyways... Somebody also asked me for a list of books. Now, David Weatherly has written about 11 different states. So if anybody had, there were two, two different people asked me about that. Um, and so to answer the question, yeah, David, what, is it, what, how many books has he written? I don't know how many books he's written, but I know that he's written about 11 states right now. North Carolina, Nevada, I think Indiana. <clears throat> I mean, I think Georgia might be one. I can't, I can't remember them all, but I got them all in this back here. So we got to get them on to talk about some of these because I had them on for the Alaskan one. The Alaskan one still is my favorite of the three I've read so far, or four, I guess. But pretty cool, pretty good stuff. Any other questions before I head out? Yeah, Phil, you got to do it, man. You're part of this PRT family. You have been for a long time. So you got to be on here. Let me know, guys, if you're interested in, in purchasing hats that were exclusive to the conference. We still have, I think, maybe 20. It's not a lot, but we still have a few. So uh, first come, first serve. We're selling those for, I think, 30. Um, I think they're 30. I don't know. I got to ask Anthony what it's, what it's listed at, whatever it is. <clears throat> those were kind of expensive because we had to, we, the, the, the patch on them is leather. When we have patches for PRT, but we're not selling those. We're just giving those and the keychains away if you win the giveaway. And you can get, win the giveaway by, by leaving a comment on, the, sh on the, the show when I put the official link on there to the PRT or the Paranormal Roundtable group page, group, whatever it's called. Anything gets mad when I say page because it's a group. Um, then, then go ahead and leave your comment. And if you're chosen by one of us on the team, because uh, I'm not the only one that chooses, but if you're chosen, then you will receive a free autograph book. And then you will also, I'll throw patches in there until, to the limited supply until they're gone. Also, we still have, hey, Anthony, we still have a lot of tumblers left or not? How many we got? We have a lot of tumblers left. Good. We have a lot of tumblers left. You know, we should have like put those out there because what we were doing when they we would sell them, we wouldn't replace them. That was why we didn't sell as many. But people were saying, "Oh, I was there. I didn't see the tumblers because yeah, we only had one or two. They thought we only had one or two colors, and then we were so busy. Or the guys, I should say, y'all were busy. We didn't get them to, to replace them quick. You know, whatever. And people didn't see them. But uh, you got one. You could show me. You have a couple of them. We're gonna show you these tumblers. So what we're gonna do to, we're gonna do tonight right now is um, I'm gonna show one of these tumblers. We have four different colors. We have we have these two, and then we have a blue, and we have a uh, maroon. It's got both logos on there. It's really cool. Isn't that cool? 
So I'm going to give away one right now. If you want, it, if you want one of these tumblers and a patch, and I'm always going to give you stickers too. Tell me right now in the comments. John Sablon says I need a book. What book do you need, John? I've got a lot of different books from a lot of different people. Namiri says I have the blue. Overbuilt Automotive says, what's that? That's what this is. Okay. You open it up like that. I think we were selling these for, I think these go for 25. But I'll give away one right now on the show. Four different colors to choose from. If you want to buy them, send me a message. And I can ship them out to you. Namiria says, I went in Marvin's book. Marvin has a book? Somebody who's never won anything before, tell me, hey, I've never won right now. Let me know. Now, Brian Taylor. Have you ever won anything from me, Brian? I got two tumblers right here I'm giving away. So we got Brian Taylor. Brian, let me know if, you, if you're listening. Oh, you mean Martin. I thought you said Marvin. I'm sorry. I'm here. <laughs> JG72 says, I've I never won. How long have you been a listener, JG? Bernard Fox, you've been listening for a while. I've seen you in the chat. I'll pick you. You've been in here for a while, and, you're, and you haven't won anything? Brian, let me know that you're listening, man. There he is. Yes, I have won before. Okay, so you've won before. So, Bernard Fox, thank you for being honest, though, Brian. I appreciate that, dude. We'll get you. Send me a message, Brian. Maybe I can work something out with you. Mike Turner says, do you have any more books from Linda Godfrey? Yeah, I do, Mike, but I don't have very many. But, Mike, you've been a listener for a long time. Have I sent you a book? Ona Holly, you've never won. I've seen you in here for a long time, too. Kevin Clow, you've never won? So Kevin Clow, Ona Holly, Bernard Fox. Do we have the other two colors? Yeah. Grab those real quick. I'm gonna do a little game here. Phil Stern says Marvin's book was great. Marvin's is a friend of mine now. Marvin, I like Marvin actually. Me and Marvin, he's we're cool, man. We haven't had problems. We had that beef, but we know who started it and caused it, so. And like I said, if you want if you want to buy one, they're twenty five. That's all. You know, we these were expensive too. We had them made exclusively for the conference. But you know, I'd be willing to put them all and then take them to the postal annex and give them, sell them, whatever I got to do. There's the other other colors. Okay. So what we're gonna do right now, Bernard. Um, everybody whose name I mentioned, Anna Holly, Kevin Clow. Man, I'm sorry, guys. My eyes were are burning, dude. They were they've been burning ever since I've been in here. I don't know what it is from the rain or something. My eyes are burning. My nose is it's just oh god. I'm sorry if you saw on the show. I was patting my eyes down. It was like God, man. And I've been sitting here, and my eyes are just burning like crazy. Sugar Britches never won anything. 
Okay, sugar britches, that's fine. All right, so sugar britches, you got to give me your real name. I can't send it in care in care of sugar britches because I don't know. They're, they're gonna be like, okay, what is this? So, if if you want me to sign it, I I'll sign it for you. I don't know why you'd want my autograph, but. Mike Turner, thank you for being honest. And said, oh yeah, you've won before. But Linda Godfrey's book, I don't know. I got a few of them. Just like a handful of them left. And I have no plans of really parting with those. I can get all the books I want, but I can't, I mean, I can't get them signed. So. Phil says I will buy a hoodie and a tumbler. Sending it to Germany would be we'd have to we have to figure something out, Stern. Because I sent you that stuff from German to Germany that one time. Boy, it was expensive. I can only imagine what it is now with inflation. So Bernard, he says, please autograph. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll get a silver sharpie and I'll get that done. I haven't. If if anybody's listening that has won, send me a message and let me know that you've won. Because I'm way behind, I'm backed up, and I need to write. I need to come in here one day and write everything down, and then take it all to Postal Annex, where I do my mail offs and let them do it. Because I have a bunch of people I need to send stuff to, so it may be next week before I can get to all of it to get your stuff mailed out. But I'll get it done. So Bernard, we'll start with you. Which color do you want? Sugar Britches, Kevin Clow. Who all won? We got we got Sugar Britches, Kevin Clow. Bernard Fox and Anna Holly. She says, I would love a tumbler and a keychain if possible. Anna, what color do you want? Gotta let you gotta let me know right now. Blue. Okay, so we got Bernard answered first. He got blue. There are the other two. Sugar Britches, Anna Holly. Let me know what colors you want. Okay, so black, Kevin, black. You guys are going to have to message me on Messenger on Facebook just so I can keep track. <clears throat> or maybe email me. Sugar Bridges says red. Anna Holly says green. Well, that works out. There we go. All y'all kind of chose a different color. But I won't be able to keep track unless you, you message me. Okay. And the best way to try to win is just to go and leave a comment on the uh, when I drop the uh, links in the Paranormal Roundtable group. Okay, guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Uh, Martin Groves will be when his books arrive. I'll be giving them away. We'll do, we'll do giveaways. All right, I'll see you guys later, man. Reading the comments.
John, thank you for that for that donation. You're always so kind. Thank you to Shotzi for that big donation. We appreciate that. All right, guys. Thank you for giving me your address there. I appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Thank you for being the best part of PR today. I really enjoyed reading the comments. Sorry, I'm just sitting here reading it. But... All right, I'll see you.